reported to me that you know, while being escorted to the car, he um, asked, I'm going to summarize what I remember, what I was told, uh, that the, uh, he, he was telling a joke. And he told the uh, juror, or the juror, he told the officer, you know, he, he, he made a reference to telling a joke about uh, why did it take seven shots to shoot Jacob Blake, something to that effect. It, it, it dealt with shots and it dealt with Jacob Blake. And I did uh, reveal it to you attorneys yesterday and uh, at the close of the day, uh, after giving it some thought, uh, there was a request by the state to excuse Juror 7. And uh, the last word ahead was the defense objected. Well, Judge, I think that it, I would object to at least having the, I would ask that the juror come in. And well, I want to hear his right. side of it before I do yes. anything. Right. Uh, but I did want to get your position. That or you don't want to form a position until you've heard from him? I think that's the appropriate thing to do. Okay, yeah. and I think you're right. Um, so uh, Can let's. I just add a little bit, Your Honor. Oh, please do. Yes. Um, what I heard and um, from you yesterday, and I understand this is literally fourth hand from the juror to Lieutenant Zerline to you to us. So I wasn't there. I don't know exactly what the juror said, but it was my understanding. It was something along the lines of, "Why did the Kenosha police shoot Jacob Blake seven times?" That's what I thought you had said to us. And that, that, that may have been. Sure. That puzzled me for a moment, it's, and you made it sound like it was the beginning of a joke, um, so I wondered what the rest of the joke is. Uh, it's my understanding that the rest of the joke is because they ran out of bullets. To me, that is, uh, anyone who would find that funny uh, would be uh, finding the implication that if the Kenosha police had more than seven bullets, they would have continued to shoot Jacob Blake. which I think comes into play in the subtext of this case. And beyond that, for a juror in the midst of a trial like this, well, you know, which let, stems from the Jacob Blake, may, may I finish, Your Honor? I'm no, sorry. you can't, because I think that the better course is to let the juror respond, and then, um, and then uh, I'll, I'll certainly want to hear what you have, the rest of what you have to say. Uh, but uh, I, I would think it would become better after he's had a chance to respond. Understood. Thank you. So, um, is he, uh, I assume he's on this level? Upstairs. He's upstairs? Or would you uh, ask him to come down, please? I'll ask him to get it. Yeah, get a deputy. Is there anybody in back? Oh, Your Honor, the other matter that was pending was Mr. Binger's objection to my question. Yeah. Um, I will withdraw that question. It's going to come in with the next second or next witness, and that's fine. As you wish. Then the next thing is um, a note from a juror. We came this morning. Well, I got another. I've got two of them. Oh, okay. oh. Yeah, the one from yesterday. This came at the end of the day yesterday. I think you've already been given copies. Um, Yes, please. Bring them over. Bring, bring them uh, over here. So okay. I, I assume that's easier than him squeezing through here. It's been a challenge for him. Um, and this says, I heard the name of Lucas Zanon something in today's, does that say video? Is that what that says? I heard the name of Lucas Zanon something, video maybe. Uh, in today's testimony, I never heard his name in the jury polling, which I'm quite sure it was in there. Um, I know of someone with that name, have never discussed anything about this case prior to this, nor was I aware he did video of the happenings. 
for all I know it's not even the same person but did want this disclosed to you anybody want to do anything about this letter I would just note I think the name was read by both sides. I, I was quite sure that it had been read. Beyond that, I, I don't think is, any action needs to be taken. Is he a videographer too? He took what's been referred to as the video on 63rd, looking at car source. It's already been played. Oh, okay. Okay, no. Okay. It's not a common name, so I'm sure it's the same Lucas Zan. Yeah. You want to do anything about it? No. State? No. Okay, number, this is the one just I just received. And it just says number 49 express, I guess this is probably written by one of the bailiffs. Uh, express, number 49 express that he cannot see videos at his, with his trifocals mentioned in Jerome after day was over. Number 49 uh, having trouble seeing due to his trifocals. Bailiff and put him in a seat where he can see. Uh, let's hope. Uh, number 49. Uh, see if uh, there's a better location where he can sit and still be able to see the videos. And also, if there's any videos that he definitely feels he needs to view again, we need to know about that. Okay. Then, one more thing, um, after I took a poll from the jury yesterday about the heating conditions in here, um, I, and it, was, it came out about two, two, to, two to one in favor of leaving, saying that the temperature was, was um, okay. Um, not everyone agreed with that. And so uh, I had it mildly adjusted because it had been turned down uh, quite a bit the day before. Could be quite, while we were in the, in the library on Monday, apparently that it did get quite warm in here. So I said, well, turn it up halfway to where you turned it down. Uh, now, so I'm going to ask the jury uh, how they thought the temperature was yesterday. Um, but the, and the reason I'm doing that is because my wife caught a little bit of the action on television yesterday and told me that the media were complaining that it was stiflingly hot in uh, is that true how many in the in the in the audience portion media or not uh, felt it was extraordinarily warm in here yesterday you were cold okay well i may bring my heater up here so um i'll let you sit up here and try to benefit from that Nobody's complaining. Well, someone apparently did on TV, so I don't know. Um, good af Good morning, sir. Um, I'm gonna. Can you give him a, give him a handheld? Um, Judge. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the court reporter. Sure. Can you move over so the reporter can see you? Just uh, about ten feet over towards the back door or the front door, rather. Uh, more, a little bit more, more. Right there is good. Okay. Uh, okay. I, the reason I asked you to come down was um, there was a. Uh, I was told that uh, while you were being escorted to the car uh, the other day, that you. Uh, began to tell a joke um, about the shooting of Jacob Blake and I wanted to see if is that accurate or not not it is okay um, uh, are you comfortable repeating what the joke was or do you want to just leave it alone I, I'm going to tell you that um, uh, I, I spoke about um, well I guess I'll hear from mr. Uh, do you want to finish what you were saying I will tell you, I will tell you that um, I've talked quite a bit about public confidence in the outcome of the trial, and regardless of whether uh, the uh, issue is as grave as you presented it in terms of inner feelings, uh, it is clear that the appearance of bias is present, 
and it would seriously undermine the the uh, outcome of the case. Uh, so that in itself would be sufficient cause for discharge. But if you want to expand on that, you're welcome to. No, you are. Did you want to say anything, defense? If, it, if number seven is unwilling to to repeat it, what it was, um, I think we're at a disadvantage, um, and I suppose his unwillingness could be taken in the worst light. Um, so. Uh, based on the unwillingness at this point, I think it's probably the proper course. Okay. All right. I, I think uh, the best thing out of the circumstances, I'm going to dismiss you from the jury, sir. Uh, and we do thank you for taking the time to come down here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my feeling is that it was nothing to do with the case. It wasn't anything to do with Kyle and his seven charges. No, no, no here. And, and I have not, I, I've not stated that you have uh, it's not, you know, one of the things that I have to do when I have to make judgments, I try to confine my judgments to the things I have to judge and not to forming opinions about other people other than that. So I don't want to get into that. The point I'm making is that the public needs to be confident that this is a fair trial. And it, I think even at the, at the very most, it, it, was a, it was bad judgment to tell a joke of that nature. Okay, so that's okay. Thank you very much, sir. Did I say at the very least or at the very most? Uh, at, the, at the very least, it was bad judgment. Mm. All right. Um, now, anything else other than checking with the t checking the jury's temperature? If the uh, question is being withdrawn, then there's no need to resolve the objection, and we can continue with the testimony. I think. Splendid. Judge, I, I would ask that if you just address the jury generally and instruct them that if they cannot hear or see anything, to let us know immediately. As you've already gone through oh, yes, that's two a, days. That's okay. Excellent point. Come down, please. Yes. Thank you.
assume this one? Yes. Yeah, there's a The, the jurors come before Court TV, and I, and I think Court TV has been doing a wonderful job, but we can't have that monitor there. Pardon me? Well, at least for right now. Well, why don't you call somebody up from Court TV and see if there's a way that it'll work for everybody? They can't see Mr. Richards when they can't see The TV is in front of Mr. Richards. Yeah, I think down might be a good start. It, will it fit over here where the where we've been using the ASO? Is okay with what? Moving it over by the bar. Okay. All right. Now the next thing is. Uh, yesterday, if you recall, I asked you about your comfort level in terms of temperature, and you took a vote, and it was about two to one in favor of uh, that things had been just about right. I thought it was cold, <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? So I um, I had him nudge it up a little bit. Now I shouldn't have told you that. I should have just asked you how was the temperature yesterday. How many felt it was too warm in here yesterday? How many felt it was too cold? How many were just perfect? Look at that. <laughs> wonderful. What a wonderful jury to work with. Okay. And finally, uh, Mr. Number Seven is no longer on the jury. I've dismissed him. Um, and uh, so we'll proceed with the 19 of you. Okay. Anything else? Uh, let's go. This is a search warrant for Gage Gross Kreutz's cell phone. And what is the date and time that's on the front page of that, at the lower left corner? Uh, September 23rd, 2020, at 8.12 p.m. Okay. And that was the day before the interview of Gage Grosskreutz? I believe so. Move Exhibit 37 into evidence. Is there objection? No. Detective, on... August 26th of 2020, you were at the Antioch Police Department and informed Kyle Rittenhouse that he was being detained for the charge of first degree murder at approximately 6.40 a.m., correct? That sounds about right. And a criminal complaint which brought him into this court was filed the next day in consultation with the District Attorney's Office on August 27th of 2020. In your course of investigation, wrote um, a lengthy police report, um, approximately 57 pages. Yes. And that s summarizes, for a lack of a better word, um, much of your involvement in this case, not all of it. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm referring to page of your report, 55 of 57. You received a thumb drive from um, the FBI, correct? Uh, Detective Answer Amy received that okay. thumb drive. You viewed information from the videos of that thumb drive. Oh, sorry, I, I was thinking about the the drone footage, or the the the, the, the fixed wing aircraft okay. footage that we saw here. That was obtained by Detective Answer Amy, but I also received a thumb drive. Yes, from, okay, from the FBI and. Specifically, I'm referring to FBI video AE5, if we could have that on the screen. 
And I'm going to read from your report and tell me if I'm reading correctly, and then we'll play the video. Okay. It's on. Page 55 of 57, second to last paragraph, stating in your words, at 41 seconds into the video, something appears to draw the attention of the videographer. The video quickly pans to the right, parent to the north closed parent, and directly to Kyle Rittenhouse and Joseph Rosenbaum. When the video reaches them, a male voice is heard yelling, gun, gun, gun. You won't do shit, motherfucker, exclamation mark. This appears to be Joseph Rosenbaum yelling. Do you remember that? Yes. This is the video you're speaking of? Yes. Okay, please play the video. Started at one. Duramax just got, oh. That Duramax got fucking beat, yo. Damn, homie's out here. Mr. Rosenbaum uses, and you opine that that is in fact Mr. Rosenbaum's voice, correct? Yes. And that opinion is based upon you listening to other vi um, videos that have Mr. Rosenbaum's voice on them, correct? Yes, and also what is depicted in the video. Okay, and that's Kyle with a gun and Mr. Rosenbaum chasing him. Yes. I have nothing further. Detective Howard, I just have a few follow-up questions. Yesterday you were asked about that search warrant that you obtained for Mr. Grosskreutz's phone. Is that correct? Correct. At the time that you obtained that search warrant, did you consider Mr. Grosskreutz to be a victim of a crime? Yes. You mentioned something called Marcy's Law yesterday. What is that, to, as you understand it? Marcy's Law is a relatively new law in the state of Wisconsin which grants victims more rights. I would ask the court to take judicial notice that on April 7th, 2020, Wisconsin voters amended the Wisconsin State Constitution uh, under a uh, ballot initiative called Marcy's Law. That took effect on May 4th, 2020. Will the court take judicial notice of that? Uh, there are some things that even lawyers can't argue about, and uh, they can be put in a category called judicial notice. For example, um, <clears throat> no one could reasonably contend that uh, Christmas doesn't fall on the 25th of December, so that can be judicially noticed, and the lawyers are agreed in this case that, uh, that something not in dispute in this case is that uh, the voters on the date which he's indicated approved uh, an amendment to the Wisconsin Constitution uh, that is called, I don't know if its official name is Marcy's Law, but it's 
It's uh, everyday usage, and uh, name is uh, Marcy's Law. Any question about that? That uh, that was adopted as part of the state constitution. What, would what was the date? The effective date was May 4th, 2020. Okay, it was not adopted on that date, but became effective as of that date. Okay, thank you. The uh, exhibit 37, the search warrant for Gage Grosskreutz was obtained approximately four months after that on September 23rd, 2020. Does that sound right to you? Correct. Okay. And you, I think you mentioned yesterday that at that time it wasn't clear to you and uh, the department uh, what the effect of Marcy's law and those enhanced protections for victims would have on your ability to get search warrants for phones in this type of situation. Is that fair to say? Yeah, so my, my intent when I wrote the search warrant was to obtain more information, and I was not thinking about Marcy's Law as I was writing the search warrant, but I uh, started thinking about it afterwards and wanted to err on the side of caution in respect of Mr. Grosskreutz's rights. You were also asked questions about whether or not your interviews uh, with uh, certain people were recorded. Um, can you explain to the jury what the normal practice is as a detective with the Kenosha Police Department? Uh, when you decide what interviews you do are going to be recorded and which ones you may not record? We, we typically will always record a custodial subject. Those interviews will always be in a recorded interview room. Typically we will put uh, witnesses and uh, complainants in, in non-recording interview rooms to obtain their statement. Uh, in this investigation we put a lot of witnesses and uh, well, we have we have four rooms interview rooms in our detective bureau uh, three of which are always recording no matter what and one of these rooms is delegated as a room that we uh, that we will put complaining witnesses and witnesses in that room so we can conduct an interview without it being recorded uh, the in interviews that we conducted throughout the course of this investigation uh, we didn't intend to interview or uh, record all of them, but some of those interviews were, were taking place inside of uh, interview rooms that are always recording. So when we were able to go back, we were able to, even though we didn't intend to record those, we were able to pull those. Uh, but the ones that were conducted in the non, the, the interview room that isn't always recording, there isn't a, a record, a video and audio of that. Is it fair to say, Detective, that when you're dealing with someone that you con you consider to be the victim of a crime, you typically do not record those interviews with audio or visual? Is that fair to say? Yes. You were asked a question regarding the individual who has not been identified, the individual who came in and attempted to kick Mr. Rittenhouse in the face. Um, and uh, you indicated despite your efforts that person has not come forward and you've not been able to identify him. Is that correct? Correct. In the 14 months that you've been investigating this case, have you experienced individuals who have been reluctant to come forward and provide information? We experienced a lot of reluctance in gathering information in this investigation. Why do you think that is? Fair enough. You were asked a question regarding Mr. Rosenbaum, and uh, at some point during the evening, there's an allegation that he was holding a chain. You've seen photos or something to that effect. Is that fair to say? Yes. Based on your investigation and your understanding of the timing of all of the events of that evening, do you know approximately when in the evening Mr. Rosenbaum had that chain? I know location is going to be the area of St. James because based on the information that it, we were able to gather, uh, it appears that he obtained that chain from the St. James campus. And uh, so uh, it's hard to put an ex exact time on it, but I would estimate uh, a couple hours before the, the incident at Sheridan and 63rd takes place. Before you were shot by the defendant? Yes. In your investigation, have you seen any indication that Mr. Rosenbaum possessed that chain at the ultimate gas station on the southeast corner of 60th and Sheridan? No. The defense has alluded to Mr. Rosenbaum being involved in verbal disputes, altercations, whatever you want to call them, 
there's a dumpster involved, etc. At any point in any of those scenes at Ultimate Gas Station, does Mr. Rosenbaum have any sort of weapon in his hand? Just a plastic bag. Just the plastic bag? Yes. No gun? No. No knife? No. No chain? Not at Ultimate Gas, no. No baseball bat or club or any kind like that? No. As far as you can tell on all those videos, is the only thing he's ever holding in his hand that plastic bag? South of 60th Street, yes. As he's, you've seen the video of Mr. Rosenbaum walking south on Sheridan towards the 63rd uh, Street car source where he is shot by the defendant, correct? Yes. As he's walking down that street, is there any indication at any point that he's ever armed with anything? Just the plastic bag in his hand. Doesn't have a gun, correct? Correct. No knife? No Just knife. An this is a different part of the, e the Overall. sequence. Overall. No gun? No. No knife? No. No baseball bat or club? No. No chain? No. Obviously, in the end, at the, the time that he is shot and killed by the defendant at the 63rd Street car source, is there any evidence in the record of any kind that you've seen as the lead detective in the case that Mr. Rosenbaum was armed with a weapon? No. He had the plastic bag, which he threw, and then had nothing in his hands after that. I want to talk about that incident at the 63rd car source where the defendant shoots and kills the defendant, or the, Mr. Rosenbaum. Can we please pull up exhibit number 19? Can we please play exhibit number 19? This is the uh, video that is entitled Drew Hernandez Shooting Video. For the record, I'm just going to point out the parties uh, as they're walking here. For the jury's benefit, we've heard testimony about this. This is a video that's taken uh, as people are walking south on Sheridan for Street. This individual is Richie McGinnis, and this is the defendant in front of him. Agreed? Yes. <laughs> Please continue. Detective Howard, on the screen there, uh, it appears to show the uh, car source dealership, uh, correct? The, the car source at 63rd and Sheridan, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, would you help us to understand, um, maybe using the laser pointer on the map, uh, approximately where this person would be standing when they're taking this video? Right. Drew Hernandez at this time is on the, the north end of the car source. so. Looks like he's standing in the, in the grass if you look at the bottom of the screen. So I'd say he's he's right about here, and his uh, his video is pointing south into the parking lot. So I, I'd put him right about here in the grass. The property that you are pointing to there on the map, which is just to the north of the car source, what is located on that lot? That's one house. So this individual, Mr. Hernandez, is in the, the yard of that house. Is that fair to say? Yes, this house right here. Okay. And the grass right there. All right, please continue the video. <laughs>
lower right hand corner of that screen, there appears to be an object laying on the ground. Do you see that? Yes. Can you identify that for us? That is the plastic bag that Joseph Rosenbaum can be seen throwing in other videos. All right, please continue the video. Can we now please go back and show the FBI, uh, actually no, I'm sorry, um, I believe it is exhibit number 25, the FBI video with markings please. Detective Howard, in this uh, exhibit, exhibit number 25, I think we've already established that person of interest number one with the circle around him is Joseph Rosenbaum. Is that correct? Correct. And this shows where he runs immediately upon entering the car source lot. Would you agree with me on that? Yes. Can you describe for the jury, based on what you're seeing there, where it appears he's located at, that, at the moment of this video? Pretty close to where Drew Hernandez was standing in the last video we watched. So uh, this right here is going to be that. Uh, so all right, I'd put Mr. Rosenbaum right about here at the far north end of the car source parking lot. And I think it's important to note that on this map, the car source lot is, is filled with cars. But as we can see in the aerial footage, there's it's not filled with cars at this point in time. So. I would put him uh, right about, Mr. Rosenbaum, right about here. Okay. Uh, please continue the video for just a couple more seconds, then I'll have you stop. All right. Go ahead and stop that, please. Now, can we go back to uh, the last video, which is exhibit number 19? Sorry, but <clears throat> uh, someone had inquired about whether, uh, using the laser on the screen. And I can't tell you why, but the lasers do not work on the screen. That's why we have to use Sister Marcian's pointer for that. Um, so, um, and there it is. But, uh, and I knew it well. But uh, um, I apologize that we can't, we don't have, I don't know what, Whatever. Can we please play exhibit number 19? Detective Howard, after watching that last video, which showed the movements of Mr. Rosenbaum, are you able to tell on this video, I know this doesn't show Mr. Rosenbaum in the proximity of where he originally went when he got to car source, but are you able to tell on this video where he went initially? You know, does, that, does that make sense? I would put him at the, uh, approximately the, the front passenger tire of that white sedan adjacent to where that gentleman is standing. Okay. Thank you. Now, there is a, there's been a lot of testimony regarding uh, the shot that was fired by Joshua Zeminski. Um, 
Did Joshua Zeminski fire that shot in the direction of any particular person? Objection. If he knows, he can answer. Well, I, how would he know? You're going to have to set the foundation as to how Absolutely. You know. Have you watched uh, the videos that show Mr. Zeminski firing that shot? Yes. Where is he pointing the gun? Straight up in the air. You also testified that the lapse in time between that gunshot and the defendant shooting Mr. Rosenbaum was two and a half seconds, 2.5 seconds. Is that right? Approximately, yes. You said you based that on timing with a stopwatch? Yes. Did you do that based on one of the videos in the case? No, I believe I did it with approximately five or six of the videos. So you went through five or six videos and each one of them timed it with a stopwatch and determined that they're all right about 2.5 seconds? Yes. I have nothing further. which was just shown and you pointed to the can you bring that up where they're standing on the grass Mr. Hernandez go forward to further a little bit more stop you can play from there please stop when you talk about the white sedan that's the one that's centered right in the middle of the frame now that's been frozen correct correct and it's your belief in sinking in your mind when looking at the aerial footage that he would have went up approximately to the driver's side passenger tire? No, the you said the driver's side passenger tire. The the passengers the, the front passenger tire, I would approximate that that's where Mr. Rosenbaum went. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. Are we talking here or between these two vehicles? And when I'm pointing at the vehicle, I'm pointing at the white sedan and what looks to be like a silver late model Cadillac. I'm, I would estimate the, the white sedan that's, in, that's closer to us in this video. So you're saying he's here? I would estimate there. Okay, and not between these two vehicles, correct? That's my estimation, Did yes. we have the... Um, video that was just shown to him, the aerial video, please. Stop. Person of interest one is Mr. Rosenbaum. Yes. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a vehicle I'm pointing at right here, which is the vehicle nearest the only house on that block. Yes. So he's not on the passenger side. He's between what I would refer to as if the Duramax is car number one, there's car number two, the late model Cadillac, and then the white sedan. Yes. So he's between them. That's what appeared. The FBI has a vet better depiction of that, yes. So when you testify that he was at the passenger side of the white vehicle, that's not correct. Not correct. And you see person of interest one, which is my client, Mr. Rittenhouse, he doesn't go into these cars after him, correct? Oh, he's person of interest two on this video, and uh, Mr. Rittenhouse does not, he, he stays closer to the, uh, the sidewalk area. And he walks down in this location to the corner the Duramax vehicle. In that approximate area, yes. Where he's then, the individual comes up from behind him, Mr. Rosenbaum. Mr. Rosenbaum comes around, uh, around those vehicles towards Mr. Rittenhouse. And we're not suggesting, or excuse me, you're not suggesting that there was more than one chase, correct? The, 
at any point in the evening or no just car source three that night at approximately 11 50 p.m on this car source property i observe one chase okay. and you testified on redirect about marcy's law do you remember that yes and you were told by someone or detective anteramy was told us by somebody about marcy's law and you couldn't go in the phone even though there was a signed search warrant, correct? It was airing on the side of caution. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, but your department went into Mr. Huber's phone without a search warrant. He's deceased. He's still a complaining witness, deceased or victim, however you want to label him, correct? I think it's different. If, if someone is deceased, then they, are, they don't even have the ability to give consent. They're a state, correct? What I'm getting at is you went in the phone without a warrant for Mr. Huber, correct? We don't need search warrants if they're deceased. That's your opinion, correct? Yes. Okay. You went and you got a search warrant, which you drafted and were the affiant, meaning you swore to it, for Mr. Grosquitz's phone, correct? Correct. And then it was never executed, correct? No, because I did not feel comfortable with my knowledge of Marcy's Law, and I wanted to err on the side of caution with that. He's nodding at you right now, isn't he? He's what? I'm pointing at Mr. Binger as he's nodding at you, correct? I was not even looking at Mr. Binger. I was looking at you. Okay. Last night during the break overnight, did you talk about this testimony? No. With nobody from, can I finish the question? You can finish. Nobody from the Racine Dis Kenosha District Attorney's Office about this issue. Never talked about it. No. Okay. If you don't have a search warrant, you can get into the phone other ways, correct? Which phone are we talking about? Grosswitz's. I see you have consent on one side or a search warrant on the other side. Okay. And consent was asked for, correct? Correct. Was turned down, correct? Correct. Nothing further. Nothing further, I said. I'm sorry. Okay. No further you may step down, sir. The state calls Richie McGinnis. If you could please make sure to pull that microphone close and speak as loud as you can into it. Thank you. Could you state your name for the record and spell your last name? Richie McGinnis. Oh. Richie McGinnis. R-I-C-H-I-E-M-C-G-I-N-N-I-S-S. -S. How are you currently employed? Uh, I'm the video director for The Daily Caller. What is The Daily Caller? Uh, it's a news website. 
How long have you been working for the Daily Caller? Since May of 2017. When you say you are the uh, video editor, you said? Uh, technically chief video director. It's chief video director. What are your responsibilities? I oversee all of the video content that goes up on the website and all of our uh, video and social media platforms. Is it fair to say that the Daily Caller is um, an online news source as opposed to, say, a newspaper or a magazine? Yeah, there's no print. Okay. And uh, what is your educational background? Uh, I, I have a bachelor's in uh, Middle Eastern history and Arabic uh, from Georgetown University. Would you consider yourself a journalist? Um, I would consider myself somebody who works alongside journalists every day. Okay. When you say you work alongside them, what are the different roles that you have versus uh, the journalists that you work alongside? So basically the journalists are the ones who actually uh, post the articles. Um, I'm the one who, uh, you know, for example, if a journalist is you know, on a location, they record a video, uh, I'm the person who helps them get that video onto whatever platform necessary. Um, as well as, you know, packaging the video, uh, distributing it, and, you know, just helping them with any technical uh, issues associated with that. Who were the founders of The Daily Caller? Uh, Neil Patel and Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson is a Fox News uh, personality, is that fair to say? Yeah. And did there come a time where you personally uh, showed an interest in covering some of the protests that are going around going on around the country. Uh, yes, absolutely. Can you tell us about what your your focus was in that regard? Well, um, at the time that the protests erupted um, in Memorial Day of 2020, uh, it was very clear from the onset that uh, actually two of our reporters, uh, Jorge and Shelby, who were with me in, in Kenosha, they. Uh, were in Washington, D.C. I was actually with my family in New York at the time. But that first weekend, um, there were you know, violent riots and, and, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. And after that weekend, it, it was very evident to me that Shelby and Jorge, being young and, and brave folks, uh, were able to capture um, aspects of what was going on that, that I didn't see elsewhere in the media. And uh, that's when it became clear to me that uh, we could uh, show the public um, a side of what was happening that the corporate press wasn't keen to, to show. You mentioned that these began around Memorial Day of 2020. Was that in part because of what happened to George Floyd in correct. Minneapolis? Yes, correct. As far as you personally, um, you talked about some events in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Were you one of the folks that was uh, covering any of that? I returned, the, back, to, I returned back to Washington. Uh, I was in New York with my family. I returned back to Washington on actually Memorial Day, that Monday. And starting on that day, uh, I was on the ground with our reporters. Other than Washington, D.C., over the summer of 2020, did you go around to other locations to cover these types of events? Yes, I did. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, we went to Seattle, we went to Portland, we went, uh, we were in Washington, D.C., obviously, uh, New York, um, Kenosha, um, and, you know, basically, it was very clear to us that while, you know, for example, cable news correspondents would go in and, and say what was going on, and then they'd leave and go back to their hotels, we just hung out in these places for hours and hours on end. Um, and we just used our phones to show the public what was happening. At these events that you covered in Seattle, Portland, et cetera, um, were you ever personally exposed to uh, violence or rioting or arson or anything along those lines? Yes. Tell us uh, about some of the experiences that you had at those locations. Um, well, Portland, for example, there was a lot of uh, clashing with uh, law enforcement, there was a lot of um, I saw incendiary devices thrown at police, um, and uh, Seattle was a situation where um, we did see some violent clashes between uh, protesters and counter-protesters, um, and the, sa the same in New York as well, uh, you know, police breaking up 
the occupied protests, uh, people clashing with the police. And in fact, in New York, for example, um, you know, if, you, if you're one of these people in there, you know, we're dressed up to look just like everybody else. But uh, if you film uh, one of those violent interactions, then it's, it's uh, only a matter of time if somebody sees you that you know, the crowd will turn on you. And uh, that did happen in New York uh, to Shelby and I. When the crowd turned on you in New York, did you feel like your safety, your personal safety was at risk? Yes. Did you actually suffer any sort of injuries as a result of that? I bear hugged Shelby and I dragged, we, I dragged her out and uh, no, I did not. Okay. Um, I have suffered injuries in, in these zones, but not in that instance. Okay. I want to move forward to Kenosha. Um, Everybody here is familiar with the shooting of Jacob Blake on Sunday night, August 23rd, 2020. Um, after that, uh, was there a time in which you became interested in coming to Kenosha to cover what was going on here? Yeah, uh, Shelby and Jorge, um, who are two of our reporters who I traveled with extensively, uh, implored me to, to book the trip and uh, we had lengthy discussions with our editor-in-chief uh, regarding whether or not we should go. Eventually the decision was made to come here, is that Correct. what you say? Yes. Do you remember when it was that you first arrived in Kenosha to begin covering these events? Yes, it was uh, that Monday. Do you remember approximately what time of day? It was the afternoon. Um, I'm not sure. It was, before it, was, it was before it was dark. There's been a lot of testimony about the events of that night, uh, some of the things that happened around town. Did you personally witness any of that? Yes. Can you tell us what you personally witnessed? Um, witnessed many cars being burned. Um, I actually, uh, Shelby recorded an interview with uh, some of the individuals in front of, uh, so there was the big car lot that was burned, but then there was the, the lot actually um, where the armed individuals were on the, on the night of the shooting. Um, we, we actually were in front of that business uh, the night before and, and Shelby recorded an interview where uh, those individuals were, there, there, there were people who, I guess, I guess the owner of the business had asked people to go out and try to put out the fires. So um, she recorded an interview with uh, individuals who were using a power washer and there were other people using like buckets to try to put out fires uh, with the cars. Uh, Mr. McGinnis, we have a map on the wall behind you there. I don't think there's going to be dispute that uh, we've established that on Monday night, the car source location, which is at the northeast corner of 59th and Sheridan Road, the, had a, a large number of cars that were destroyed by fire that night. Um, did you personally witness that? Yes. Now, you said you spoke to the owner of uh, the business. That would be the car source business? I, I didn't speak to the owner. I spoke to individuals who were out there trying to put out fires. And um, I believe in Shelby's interview, they mentioned that uh, the owner had asked them to come out to put out the fires. Now, you also mentioned there was a second location, and that would be this car source, which is sort of uh, kitty corner to the southwest. Um, and. Uh, I know you mentioned there were armed individuals there on Tuesday night, right? Yes, and that, that's the same business that, was, that we saw people with power washers at okay. the night before. At this location that I'm highlighting here, which is at the southwest corner of 59th and Sheridan, on Monday night, did you see any armed individuals there? I did not, know. Were there fires at that location on Monday night? Yes. Okay. And when you say you saw people putting out fires with uh, pressure washers, were they putting out fires only at that location on the southwest corner, or were they also trying to put out the fires on the northeast corner? It was, um, it was only at the, so it was only at that one and not, I didn't see anybody trying to put out fires on the other one across the street. Understood. I think the fires were out of control at that point, so I get that. I'm just, just trying to pin it down. So. Um, you told us that you witnessed the fires at those two locations on Monday night. Did you witness any other events on Monday night that were noteworthy? Yes, um, I mean, there were just, there were fires everywhere. Um, and Shelby Jorge and I recorded a number of those, uh, including uh, multiple businesses that uh, were also burned. 
and you uh, recorded that information and then obviously published stories about it on the Daily Caller website. Is that fair to say? That's correct, yeah. I want to move to the next night, Tuesday night, August 25th, the night of the shooting. Did you come back uh, to that area uh, to view the events of that night? Um, well, the way that it happened was we went to the courthouse to, to document the, the demonstrations that were happening in front of the courthouse. And then uh, subsequently, the police pushed the uh, protesters, demonstrators, rioters, whatever you want to call them, um, away from the courthouse. And uh, that's actually when everybody ended up in that area. On Tuesday night, based on what you've just described, do you recall approximately when it was that you first got out and were covering things? We'd been out all day. We were actually, um, during the day, we were interviewing uh, the owners of the businesses that had been damaged the night before. And so, uh, and also many people that, from the community in Kenosha came out to help clean up. And so we recorded a bunch of interviews with, um, with those folks, as well as uh, getting aerial footage of the damage. And then uh, we went and ate, and then we went back out before sunset as the demonstrators were arriving at the courthouse. When you said you took video or photos or whatever of people trying to clean up and things like that, did any of that include uh, the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse? No. Okay. Um, when you, I know you discussed some of the events that occurred right out in front, of, in front of the courthouse. Do you recall approximately what time that was when you were here at the, out in front of this building covering things? Uh, we first got out there probably about 7 p.m. And how long was it before uh, the event occurred that you described as the police pushing people out of, out of the way? That was after dark, and it was probably closer to 8.30 or 9. What did you do then? Um, well, I was typically in these kind of situations. Uh, the goal is to show both what law enforcement are dealing with and, and what, the, what the protesters, demonstrators, rioters, whatever you want to call them, um, you want to show both situations, so you want to, um, I was in the middle of the protesters on one side and the, and the police on the other, and I actually recorded, you know, um, a variety of things, including things being thrown, bricks being thrown at law enforcement, uh, and then I returned to the hotel because there was no cell service uh, to get Wi-Fi to communicate with uh, folks back in Washington, D.C., as well as uh, post the videos to, uh, for our team to then redistribute. What hotel were you staying at? Um, I forget the name of it. It's literally right there. It's, uh, uh, is it the Stella? Stella, correct. And that's located uh, a little bit off the map here, I think, to the north, uh, but very close to where all this is happening? Actually, my, my hotel window was on the uh, third or fourth floor, and it was overlooking that car lot right there. That's actually the Stella there, isn't it? Yeah. Is that um, you, after you returned to the hotel, uh, you've described what you did there. Was there a time when you came back out onto the streets after your time at the hotel? Yeah, I actually didn't. Um, I didn't even post anything because when I returned to the hotel and got on the Internet, um, I saw armed individuals in front of the same business that we had recorded people trying to put out fires the night prior. And uh, in my mind, that was a continuation of that story. And... So I actually dropped what I was doing. Um, I also had Shelby and Jorge who were out there. And once I saw people who were armed, you know, the, the situation was clearly escalated in my mind in terms of um, the level of, uh, of danger. And, and part of my role was also to, you know, make sure that none of us uh, were harmed. Um, and so I, I went outside, uh, back outside, and actually I couldn't see that business from the window, but I could see the car lot across the street from it. Um, and uh, basically, I just ran down the stairs and went right, right out there and, and started communicating with Shelby and Jorge uh, to find out where they were. The, the business where you saw the armed people out on front of, was that the uh, car source location at the southwest corner of 59th and Sheridan? Yes. You mentioned that after seeing them, you felt like the situation was escalating. Why did you feel that way? Um, anytime that there are guns, uh, that elevates the level of danger in my mind. Um, 
just given that, uh, you know, I've, I've been to, like I said, across the country, many protests um, in places where people have guns and there's a lot of people in a confined space. Um, you know, these these are the kind of situations where everybody's very passionate about why they're out there. Um, so, in my mind, that the presence of weapons meant that you know um, I should be on the ground and and. Shelby, Jorge, and I should be as close to each other as possible to ensure that, you know, we're all safe. So did you feel that the presence of guns at that location, did it make you concerned about the safety of your reporters? Yes. So you said you ran down the stairs of the hotel, uh, and you, did you go then after, after you left the hotel, did you go directly to that location, that car source at 59th and Sheridan? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Now, you've referred to guns. Uh, have, are you familiar with guns yourself? Um, I'd say familiar. One of the guns that we've talked about already in this case is um, it's technically a Smith & Wesson M&P 15, but uh -huh. it is an AR-15 type rifle. Yep. Are you familiar with that type of rifle? I've, sh I've shot it. Okay. And when you got to that 59th Street car source location, did you see individuals who were armed with that type of rifle? Yes, multiple. Tell us what you did once you left the Stella and went to that location. Uh, I went down and proceeded straight from the hotel to the car source. And basically, as I walked up, I saw, you know, I guess there were about three on the ground. And, and I couldn't quite tell how many people were on the roof. But there were, like, approximately five or six armed individuals in front of the business. And um, typically in these situations, uh, especially with armed individuals, I'm just trying to look as unassuming as possible. And so I, I put my hands up and I said, hey, um, are any of you guys willing to do an interview about why you're here? Um, yeah. Now you, in one of the, you've given interviews uh, to various media outlets about your experiences that night, correct? Yes. And at one point, you described the appearance of these in armed individuals at the 59th Street car source as menacing. Do you um, recall that? I don't recall that. What, what interview was that? Sure. I, I mean, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that's, I, I would, yeah, I would say menacing is uh, not a bad word to describe it. I would say, actually, um, like I said, it, 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 um, the presence of weapons, just in my mind, uh, is elevates the level of, of risk. You did an interview uh, shortly after this uh, August 25th incident with someone by the name of Kyle Hooten. Do you know who that yes. is? Yes, I do. And in that interview, at one point, you indicated that the uh, group at, that was armed at 59th Street Car Source appeared menacing. Would, okay. you, would you agree with that? Um, we can yeah, play, I, play I, it. I would, I would agree. Uh, I would say that I mean, I don't know the exact definition of the word menacing. I guess I was using it in a live interview. Um, but I would say that, uh, you know, if it, like a, the level of risk was elevated, okay. is what I would say. One moment.
will survive. section of the interview that you did with um, Kyle Hooten. Um, do you recognize yourself on the screen? Yeah. And do you remember uh, giving this interview to Mr. Hooten? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, can we play uh, the excerpt from 712 to 747, please? I basically just walked up to them and said, is anybody willing to do an interview? And Kyle was just the most willing. And obviously that's the kind of situation where you have five, six guys armed with some heavy weaponry. Uh, most of them looked like they had AR-15 style rifles and a couple of them were standing up on the rooftop in the darkness. So it was a, it was a menacing situation. So my goal was just to get my uh, interview and, and be as non-threatening as possible and get out of there. So when Kyle volunteered himself, I just wanted to you know go with the path of least resistance. And he actually- Thanks. Does that uh, help refresh your uh, yeah, recollection? Yeah. And this was something that you uh, said within a, a week or two after the I incident. I mean, that was, I was in Kenosha when I recorded that interview. That's in the basement of the hotel. Oh, okay. Good. That Thank you. That was like maybe a day or two after. Now, when you, I think you said in that interview, when you approached the group, you wanted to interview someone from the group. Is that fair to say? Yes. How many members of that group did you interview? Uh, one. Who is that? Well, I guess um, uh, Mr. Gulch was the other one who walked into the interview um, as I was recording, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse, and then we proceeded up the street after that. So if you would constitute that as part of the interview, then um, two. But uh, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse was the, the only one that I interviewed prior to him arriving. And I think you said Gulch, but actually, for the record, that's Ryan Balch. Balch, sorry. No yes. problem. No problem. Um, did you ask, uh, and for the record here, the person you interviewed, Kyle Rittenhouse, is seated here at council table with the gray suit and the red shirt. Is that yes, right? Yes, correct. Um, did you ask him how old he was? Um, I believe, as I was taking out my phone, um, generally, uh, the procedure is, are you willing to do an interview? Yes. Okay, I'm going to record it. Yes. And uh, I believe that I said something along the lines of, um, how old are you? And I believe the response was something along the lines of, I'm an adult. Uh, or or I, I actually don't recall because I was doing two things at once. But I just remember the answer being satisfactory enough um, for me to proceed with the interview. If the defendant had been honest with you and told you that he was 17, would you have recorded an interview with him? I would. In those instances, uh, I can record an interview if somebody's a minor, but I need permission from the parents. Based on what the defendant said to you, whatever the wording was, you had no indication from him that he was 17. Is that fair to say? I, I actually told the police the night of that uh, I believed that he was in his mid-20s, but I, I believe I said exactly that he, he had a baby face. Um, we've uh, got the interview that you recorded, and that is exhibit number uh, 16. Can we play that, please? here obviously you're armed and uh, you're in front of this so, business we saw burning last night so what's up so people are getting injured and our job is to protect this business and part of my job is to also help people if there's somebody hurt I'm running into harm's way that's why I have my rifle because I need to protect myself obviously but I also have my med kit so. and uh, what about these other folks obviously there's some other people who are armed Their as well job is to protect me gotcha and then uh, what about these guys up on the roof? Their right? job is to provide overwatch to protect me also. Gotcha. They're protecting everybody on the ground. We're protecting each other. Understood. And, and we're running medical, and we're going in, and we're getting people. And what about, are you, are you from the area? I am from the area. 
What brought you out here tonight? You just wanted to provide medical attention? Provide medical attention to the people that need it. If somebody's injured, like, you get hurt, I'm grabbing you. I got hit with plenty of, I'm getting hit with plenty of pepper balls, but, you know, as long as it's just bruises. Yeah, I got my, I got my mask. I'm good. And have you encountered any issues yet thus far with law enforcement or we anything group, like that? We had a group earlier try to come and set a fire at the church. So we went to the church and we de-escalated the situation, telling them they need to leave or they will be detained and then later arrested. This church right over here? That church right there. And we stopped the fire out all the way down at the school. Wow. And what, do you think it would have been different if the police had to try to stop them from, from setting the fire? I feel like there would be a lot more casualties and a lot more people injured. So I think the police are fine where they're at and they let us run the medical because EMS is not coming in. This is considered a red zone to the EMS. They are not coming in. Yeah. So us citizens, we need to help each other. Me and him are out here running and seeing if people need medical attention. But speaking got, of which, we need to go check to see if somebody got hurt again. All right. Understood. If you want to follow us, you're fine. Yes, sir. Absolutely. You are at this point in the video walking south along Sheridan behind the defendant and Ryan Balch, is that right? Correct. At that moment, given what you've told us about why you were out there and, and the coverage you've done with other events around the country, why did you decide at that moment to follow them? Um, well, during the interview, he mentioned, you know, what his mission was there, and it seemed to me that they were proceeding to, you know, try to do what he was talking about, and uh, I wanted to record it. Can we please play exhibit number 17? So guys are kind of like medics who are packing. Yeah, right? basically. Well, he's an EMT. And I'm gotcha. Just, I'm just kind of protecting the ass. Oh, so you're a certified EMT? Yeah. Gotcha. And do you work as an EMT normally? No, sir. I got the thing. I'm a lifeguard normally. I got my ALS and I got my Gotcha. The um, defendant tells you that he is an EMT, is that right? Um, I, yes. Did he say anything else to you? It's a little hard to hear in the video uh, as to what his qualifications were. I believe he mentioned something about uh, lifeguard certification. In your experience at the various events that you've covered similar to what was going on in Kenosha, you know, Seattle, Portland, etc., um, have you seen other individuals who proclaim themselves to be medics or EMTs who are armed with AR-15s? Um, I don't recall any um, people who, I, I saw a lot of people who were medics, some of whom were armed, but uh, not with an AR-15 that I recall. When you saw these other medics who were armed, what sort of things had they armed themselves with? Um, I just recall specifically in Seattle um, a medic armed with a handgun. Other than that one medic with a handgun, mm -hmm. do you recall seeing any other medics in any of the other events that you covered who armed themselves with a gun? No. Do you recall seeing any others that armed themselves with an AR-15? No. We can continue the video, please. And I'm former Army Infantry, and I got a whole bunch of trauma training. <laughs> well, thank you for your service. We got you. I appreciate the service. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dude. Stay away from that. There. Do you? Uh, we, it appears Mr. Balch reacts to something at this mm -hmm. point in the video. Do you know what that was? Um, that was a, I believe it was a brick that was thrown at a piece of a brick that was thrown at the uh, armored personnel carrier right there. Did it like bounce off towards you guys or something? Do you know? Yeah, uh, it bounced off. 
uh, in front of us. Okay. Thank you. Please continue. some medical weed, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Does anybody need medical? Medical! Today or today? Today. Dude, just, he just had up the gun. Come on, get off your car. Now he's talking about metal. What, what car over in the dealership? Sorry, I don't know. First of all, Miss McGinnis, the video we just watched was. Oh. <clears throat> Let's take a break at this point. Um, please don't talk about the case. Uh, read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Uh, Fifteen minutes.
Are you cold? Could you come down, please? Okay. Thank you. Oh, are you? Yeah, my wife says that, uh, that I'm too hot. <laughs> no, that, uh, that uh, <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. No, um, it's true. I, I uh, one of my daughters and and I uh, really, really turn it up high. And uh, oh yeah, and the rest of the family is must be the chocolate. I, eat. I said it must be the chocolate that I. Eat. And it's got sea salt in it. It's dark chocolate. Mm-hmm. And caramel. Oh, and caramel? I think that's what it said. It tastes like it. Either that or it's... It's always been titled in his wife's name. The interlock device has been installed on our other car. Okay, uh, let's proceed, Mr. Binger. Thank you. Mr. McGinnis, when we left off, we had finished watching the video that is entitled Richie McGinnis Walking with Kyle. It is the one in which you followed him south along Sheridan. And at some point in the video, uh, the defendant in encounters uh, a group of individuals. Um, the most noteworthy of one is uh, wearing bright yellow pants. Mm -hmm. Do you recall that? I do, yeah. And there's some interaction between the defendant and that individual. And then the defendant walks uh, across Sheridan Road. But you stayed. Yes. Why was that? Well, Kyle had told me you know, my goal going into these protest zones is to tell the full picture, or our goal. Um, and uh, after interviewing Kyle he, or Mr. Rittenhouse, uh, it was clear, you know, what he thought his mission was there. Um, but these individuals seemed to f think differently, and so I wanted to hear what their opinion was on the matter because that would be part of providing the complete picture. And the uh, individual in the yellow pants accused the defendant of pointing the, his AR-15 at that individual. Is that fair to say? Um, I believe he said, yes, yeah, something along the lines of you were waving the gun, you think you're in a movie. When you approached those individuals to speak with them, you took your, uh, was it your phone that you were yes, recording? Yes, yes. You took your phone and you, you stopped recording. You mm -hmm. pointed it to the ground and then after a while it stopped. Yeah. We've established you're a, a, a video uh, director for your website. Mm -hmm. uh, capturing video is one of the things you do. Mm -hmm. Why did you stop recording that interaction? There are four individuals there, and um, you can see in the video one of them had uh, large rocks in his hands. And, um, you know, it's a public street, so generally speaking, um, but, but just from a, the perspective of an ethical perspective as a journalist or somebody providing content, um, you generally want to get the permission of people if you want to conduct a, a proper interview. Um, so it, when I walked up to them, uh, one of the individuals who had these bricks in his hands stepped out on me like he was going to you know, smash my head. Uh, so I put my phone down and I told them, um, I'm not going to record. I just want to know why you guys are mad. Did you ever ask any of them for permission to record them? Um, I did. I, so, based on this guy's actions, they didn't want to be recorded. Um, so, I actually just I, I wanted. I was more concerned with uh, why they were mad than actually getting it on video. Just from the perspective of gathering information. 
as a someone who works in journalism and takes video, gathering information without having a record of it doesn't do much good, though, does it? Um, it, it can because uh, it, it does do good because you can, from that information, then, you know, ascertain other individuals to talk to. And also, I think there's, a, there's an aspect of gaining somebody's trust before you conduct an interview. So a lot of times it's helpful to speak with people about why you're there, um, um, why you want to interview them, and then maybe try to restart and say, hey, you know, now that we're uh, on the same level, can I do this interview? So the question I asked you right before that last one was, did you ask any of those individuals for permission to record them? And I don't believe you answered that question, but I'm assuming the answer is no, based on what you've told us. Um, I actually mentioned that I was going to stop my, I, I stopped my phone and I said, listen, guys, I'm not recording this. I just want to know what the deal is. Why are you guys mad? Okay. So um, it was clear to me that there was no permission to be granted because the guy had bricks in his hands and he wanted to. And again, I don't mean to be overly formal, Mr. McGinnis, but the question is, did you ask them for permission? I did not. Understood. And obviously, they never verbally gave you permission, correct? Um, they never said anything like, hey, go ahead, you can record us. Nothing like that. No, they did not. You took their reaction to you, this physical movement, as a sign that you shouldn't be recording them. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say, yes. Okay. You mentioned that one of the individuals had some things in his hand. I think at one point, early, uh, at one point you said rocks, and another one I think you said bricks. Well, it was like, um, I don't. I guess bricks wouldn't be the right word either because they're like gray. So I guess generally a brick would be like teric red. Um, there were like uh, pieces of uh, a gray stones that you would use to build a building. How many of these individuals uh, did you speak with that are all in a row there? Do you remember? I talked to all of them. But uh, w how many were there total? There were four. Okay. And one you said had a couple of rocks or stone in his hand? Yeah, one had um, like one in each hand, and then another one had um, like a stone in one hand, and then it was like, it was like a, a strap, leather strap, something like that. Um, that was seemed to be, I couldn't tell if it was attached because it was in his hand. Um, and uh, I believe, yeah, those are the only guys who had rocks in their hands. There were two of them. Okay. Um, other than what you've just described, did you see any other weapons of any kind on any of those four people? At the time, I did not. But uh, in hindsight, uh, I believe that one of them was armed with a handgun. With a handgun? Yes. Okay. The person who was wearing yellow pants did not have any sort of weapon, correct? No. no. Okay. Um, not so, that I could see. So uh, just so we're clear, at that moment, when you were dealing with those four individuals, you perceived two of them to have uh, rocks in their hands. And that was the extent of any sort of weapon that any of them had that you saw at that time. That I saw, yes. But in, in these kind of situations, it's never really clear who's armed and who's not. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I was still unsure of uh, my safety in that situation. Were you armed? Can you help us understand what it was about these four individuals who, by the way, all four of them are black, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. What was it about these four individuals, two of whom had rocks in their hands, that made you concerned about your safety? Um, well, the way that the one stepped out on me, it was like he, he was presenting the rocks as if he was ready to smash my head. Um, and he stepped out in my direction, at which point I kind of took one step back. Um, and in th those kind of situations, I'm just trying to keep my distance to ensure that, you know, if he's going to advance closer, that I'm going to take that many steps backwards to keep our distance. Um, yeah. Do you have any idea why this individual stepped forward towards you in such an aggressive manner? It was because of my phone. Um, because he, I, I believe that it was because he perceived me to be recording him um, and he didn't want to be recorded. Once you stopped recording, did his... So change? I put my phone down, and then I told him I'm not recording. I just want to know what happened, and his demeanor did not change, um, and he still had the rocks in his hands uh, as if he was ready to hit me. And so then I said, hey, guys, um, let's take a step back here for a second. Does anyone want to um, – I generally carry, like, cigarettes and white claws. 
to uh, diffuse these kind of situations. Um, it's like a tactic, you know, people are always really angry in these, in these areas and, and that's a good way to, I guess, break the ice. So in your experience uh, in these types of crowds, you have experienced anger, threatening behavior, that sort of thing before, is that fair to say? Yes. Definitely. And one of the ways you've learned to diffuse the situation is to offer individuals something like cigarettes Anything, or... Anything, yeah, just, just any, yeah, cigarette or, or White Claw, that's and generally... White Claw is a hard seltzer, an alcoholic beverage in a yes. can. And I actually offer, I had two in my uh, gas mask bag and I just said, does anyone want a White Claw? And it's like, you know, people generally think it's kind of funny and oftentimes take me up. Um, and it's a good tactic to kind of, you know, because the goal here is to elicit uh, the, their their truth, what they think is the reality in this situation. And um, so my goal is to basically make them feel comfortable telling me what they think the truth is, you know, um, and that's that's one tactic to achieve that. So when you offer these guys a white claw, did they take you up on it? One of them did, yeah, the guy who was squatting down in the, in the image. So you handed him the white claw? Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I said, do any of you want a white claw? I had my hands up, and I, I said, I'm going to reach. And actually, the guy who was squatting down, he started to stand up. He said, I'll take one. And uh, I pulled it out, and I used to bartend, so I cracked it for him and then handed it to him. So you gave them a total of one? One, yes. This individual you described with the rocks who stepped forward to you, can you demonstrate for us uh, the manner in which he was holding those rocks? Because you've... You made it sound like he was about to hit you with them or something. Yeah, it was, so. I mean, he was like holding it, um, you know, as if like he was ready to fight, but with rocks. So, you know, he was kind of in an athletic position and he stepped out in front of the other guys towards me like that. Um, and how close did he get to you? Um, probably eight feet. Did he I, ever? I took a step back when he took a step forward. And actually, that was part of the reason why they thought my actions were so funny to them was that I was so scared and so ready to run away. You, you say they thought your reactions were funny. How do you know they thought that they were funny? Because they all laughed when I asked them if they wanted a white claw. And, and, and um, actually, after that, uh, once I gave it to the one individual, they started making fun of the guy with the rocks, saying, oh, you think you're so tough. Like, there's one of him and four of us. And, like, look at how scared he is. They're, Sounds like, like at that point... The whatever tension was gone. Correct. Okay. Uh, and this individual who stepped forward with the rocks, did he ever throw a rock at you? No, and actually he, he put his hands down at that point um, once his, his friend made fun of him. Okay. You were never harmed in that incident in no. any way? Okay. Nope. All right. So we've seen the end of that video, uh, which uh, at that point you are talking with those four individuals uh, when you stop recording on your phone. Is that fair to say? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. We just watched a video of you following the defendant and Ryan Balch down uh, south on Sheridan. You encounter the individual with the yellow pants and the other three individuals next to him. You walk up to them after the defendant walks away. You start to have a conversation with those individuals, the, mm -hmm. the four of them, and you stop recording. Yes. Okay. What I want to know is after you stop recording, how long did you spend talking to those guys? Mm, it was a matter of minutes. Um, say less than five minutes um, that whole interaction that I just described was probably about two minutes and I talked to them for maybe another minute after that after that what happened um, I got back to my task at hand which was um, inquiring about why they were mad at um, uh, who I later found out to be mr. Rittenhouse um, and uh, they said something along the lines of yeah we were over there we we're jumping on some cars and he came up with his gun, and that was actually, right then was the point that I saw Mr. Rittenhouse running down the street, and I said, hey guys, I gotta go. Are you able to show us on that map, uh, when you saw the defendant running, uh, which you just described, where was that on that map? Are you able to show us that? Um, it was like, let's see, so we were right in this green right here, uh, we, were, we were approximately right here at the green in the parking lot, and he was running this way. Okay, you just kind of drew a line all the way from 60th down to 63rd. Are you yeah. able to be a little bit more specific as to where he was um, when, you, when you saw the defendant running? 
So you're saying where was the defendant? Yes. When you first saw him, you said he, he drew your attention because he was running. Yeah, he was. Um, so he was basically uh, right running down this corner right here. So you've indicated an area right in front of the ultimate gas station. Um, it was in front of this. Uh, we were over here. Okay. And he was here. All right. So, so again, I don't. The gas the gas station's up here. He he. It was down here. Okay. On that map, I think it's labeled the ultimate convenience center, but it's the gas station that is on the southeast oh, gotcha. corner yep. of sixty. Yes, that's and, correct. That's okay. correct. Yes. And so, uh, just because sometimes these things don't translate into the record, uh, you've used the pointer to illuminate uh, an area in front of the First United Methodist Church. On the east side of the church, uh, between the church and Sheridan Road, there's a parking lot area there, and you've kind of pointed to that as where you were talking to these four gentlemen. Is that a fair summary of yes. the location? Um, I believe, actually, it was a little bit further south, so it was like somewhere right around here. Okay. Um, so, sorry, it was actually just a bit farther. Is this south or...? The, uh, the bottom of the map is south. The bottom of the map is south, so it was a bit farther south than that, yes. Okay. And you saw the defendant running. Uh, was he? Was the defendant in Sheridan Road when you saw him running? Yes. Did you see anything in his hands when he when you first saw him? Yes. What did you see? He had um, one of those small fire extinguishers that you saw earlier in the video. It was that size fire extinguisher in uh, one hand and the uh, AR-15 in the other. What did you do next? I told the guys that I had to go, and and I proceeded after. Um, Mr. Rittenhouse. Why? Because, uh, well, he had a fire extinguisher in his hand. So, you know, I perceived that as he was running to some kind of event uh, that was taking place that would be uh, newsworthy. What did you do after that? Uh, I started jogging after him, and uh, he was uh, quite far in front of me, uh, and I, I called my coworker Shelby to inquire where she was because uh, seeing the fire, uh, the way you know that he was running and the fact that he had a fire extinguisher in his hand, I said something along the lines of, uh, uh, I won't use the expletive language that I was using, but it, something's about to go down. Where are you? Um, we should we should make sure we're next to, we're we're close to each other. You said you made a phone call to Shelby. Yes. Where were you physically when you made that phone call? So I was in the process of, I was actually jogging, um, right, like right around here. You are pointing to an area on Sheridan Road, um, just to the north of 61st Street. Yeah. Um, I was probably, I was probably right around this corner by that point that I called her, actually right around here um, because I had opened my gas mask bag for the White Claw and then I ran off without clipping it back. Um, my gas mask actually fell out of the bag. So what happened was the, the gas mask fell out, I picked it up, I put it back in the bag, I clipped the bag, and then I pulled my phone out to call Shelby. So it was, it was probably actually just south of there by the time I got on the phone with her. You have uh, given an interview in which you indicated that uh, your attention was drawn, or, or when you saw the defendant running, that you felt that he was drawing the attention of the crowd. Do you recall saying that in one of your interviews? Yeah, I think in that interview, um, I was referring, which interview are you referring to? I think it's the one that you gave uh, to Tucker Carlson, actually. But I'm not, um, I, okay, I, I believe can find that, it. that I was referring to him shouting medical. Um, and I did notice that uh, when he was running, there were a lot of people looking in that direction. There were like, um, in this area, this parking lot here, there were like dozens, if not hundreds, of protesters or rioters or whatever you want to call them um, right in here. And so when he was running, it was like kind of a, you know, people directed their attention that way for sure. You also said that you felt that um, this was going to be a hairy situation. You also characterized it as a dangerous situation. Do you recall that? Um, yes, uh, the, the combination of the fire extinguisher and the fact that he was running um, indicated to me that something was about to happen. Um, potentially, you know, if there's a fire involved, um, that's why I wanted to get a hold of Shelby and find out where she was. Did you also feel that 
the defendant running with an AR-15 through this type of crowd could cause a problem? Um, in my mind, in that moment, I couldn't think of a situation that would necessitate somebody running through a public street um, with one of their hands occupied by a fire extinguisher and the other one occupied by a weapon, um, you know, kind of serving dual roles there. That didn't, it seemed to me, um, yeah, it's, it's not the way that I was taught to handle a weapon in a public place. Did it seem a contradiction to you to have a weapon in one hand and a fire extinguisher in the other? I wouldn't say contradiction. Um, I would say that, you know, all these, like in these protest zones, there's like everybody's kind of serving a role. So uh, there were like those punk rockers that we saw, the skateboarder dudes. Um, they were clearly like kind of a fire brigade type because they all had fire extinguishers. Um, and, you know, you have like people who are medics, you have um, uh, all kinds of different roles. So I wouldn't say uh, necessarily contradictory because generally speaking, um, you know, they're, I, I just wouldn't deem that to be a contradiction. The punk rockers, the fire brigade that you described, did you see any of them with guns? I did not, no. Did you feel that uh, carrying around an AR-15 was incompatible with the role of a medic or the fire brigade? Um, I wouldn't use the word incompatible. Um, Certainly doesn't match up, though. Um, I don't know exactly what you're getting at, um, but I wouldn't say, uh, I don't know what matching means here in this instance, if you could clarify that. So you indicated that when you saw the defendant running, you left those four individuals and followed. You've described a uh, point in that uh, process where the gas mask fell to the ground, you picked it up, whatnot. Did there come a time when you were following the defendant when he was no longer running? Um, right about, uh, I, I was on the phone with Shelby at the time, and uh, right about when he slowed down, um, I was still running to catch up, so he did slow and stop, um, you know, down, down and around where the eventual shooting took place. So he starts running, uh, walks for a bit, and then there's a time after that when he begins to run again. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Where were you in relation to the defendant as you're following him down Sheridan Road? Um, so so he was probably just, you know, he was, I mean, at the moment that he slowed down, I was probably like a half a block back. He slowed down probably right around here. And I was like, I could just barely see him. I could just barely see him. Um, and so I was probably right back here when he slowed down right around here. And I was still on the phone at the time. When he... Slow, when the defendant slowed down, were you still running? Yes, I was, I was running to catch up with them. When you eventually caught up to him, um, how close were you behind him in the end? Um, so, it's hard to, I guess, from the point where he was slowed down, um, when I caught up to, caught up to him, it was just a moment after that that he started uh, running again. So I guess at that time, I was probably like 30 feet back. And you described that the defendant then began running again. Yes. Was there any event that you perceived, that you heard or saw, that attracted your attention at the same time that the defendant started running? There were a lot of people yelling. Do you know what they were yelling? There were a lot of screams. I heard like an N-word, um, and um, you can hear in the video the, the friendly, friendly, um, but it was mostly just yelling. I didn't hear really anything decipherable. We've heard some references to that friendly, friendly. Now, I know it's hard, Mr. McGinnis. I'm going to try and ask you to put yourself back in the uh, mindset of that evening. 
I, I assume since that evening, obviously you said you've given a lot of interviews, correct? So um, I, I, I gave as many interviews as I felt necessary to inform the public of what I saw. And I wasn't trying to make it exaggerate or anything like that. But no, you've, that's fine. you've given some interviews. Um, there have been a lot of videos out there on the internet. I assume you've watched some of those. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. If we can try our best to put aside what we've learned since then and mm -hmm. try and go back to that moment, and I'd like you to tell the jury what you were thinking and observing in that moment uh, without the benefit of hindsight mm -hmm. or other videos or things like that. Is that, is that yes. fair? Okay. Yes. You mentioned Friendly Friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, that moment, in that evening, mm -hmm. do you recall hearing that? I do not. Um, I recall um, I was on the phone as well. So I was talking to Shelby, and I recall hearing the yelling while I was still on the phone. And I said something along the lines of, oh, expletive, I got to go. And, um, and I hung up on Shelby, at which point that's when the running had started. Like I was already uh, basically running with the, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse and later Mr. Rosenbaum um, at that, that moment. So let's continue at the where you just left off. Mm -hmm. Please tell us what you, what happened next. It was, it was hard for me to see because like I said, I was like 30 feet back at the time. Um, but I could see a lot of yelling. I could hear a lot of yelling and I could see there was a crowd of people in the street and um, one individual, Mr. Rosenbaum, advancing towards Mr. Rittenhouse as well as a couple of other individuals who were moving very quickly um, in the area. Uh, but it was, it was hard for me to see because I was a little bit back, and it was, it was dark. What happened then? Um, Mr. Rosenbaum advanced towards Mr. Rittenhouse. Uh, Mr. Rittenhouse gave like a, I think he maybe saw him coming and you know, gave like kind of a, uh, I said on the night of uh, to police that it was like a juke, but it was more like just a, a pivot and a run. Please continue. What, what happened after that, as um, far as you recall? And, and then um, he pivoted uh, and he ran towards this um, parking lot right here. So he was like right on the side of the street and he ran towards this lot and um, Mr. Rosenbaum ran after him and I was behind both of them. So the sequence of the folks that were involved in this running, as we've seen in many other videos, is Mr. Rittenhouse is uh, in front, Mr. Rosenbaum is running after him, and you are behind Mr. Rosenbaum. Is that fair to say? Uh, yes. How far back from Mr. Rosenbaum were you as, the, as, as the, the pursuit went through the car source parking lot? Um, well, it's hard to say because I kind of caught up to them. Um, I was running a bit faster, and so uh, at the time, initially, I was probably 30 feet back when the first, when everybody first started running. But then, by the time I arrived in the lot, it was 15 feet. And you continued to be behind Mr. Rosenbaum at the time that the defendant shot and killed him, correct? Um, I did alter my trajectory a little bit um, when I saw Mr. Rittenhouse turn around and saw Mr. Rosenbaum um, lunging for the front portion of the rifle. Let me stop you there for a second. First of all, we know now that that individual who was shot and killed by the defendant was Joseph Rosenbaum. Mm -hmm. At the moment this was all going on that night, did you have any idea who that person was? No clue. Had you ever heard the name Joseph Rosenbaum before? I'd never even seen that individual. Up until these events, you had not seen that individual at any time? No, I had not. Okay. I saw, I saw videos after the fact of where he was, but I actually wasn't at that location, uh, that gas station at that time. And again, I want to hear what you yeah. saw and what you know and not gotcha. other stuff. Um, in the videos of this incident, you appear to be holding up your cell phone. Yes. Is that fair to say? Correct. Um, tell us about that. So I got off the phone with Shelby, and um, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. So I, I attempted to record on my phone, and I thought that I was recording at the time. Uh, it turns out that I actually just took a live photo of the ground. I assume at the time that I pressed uh, what was the you know photo button instead of the record button, the video button. 
So as you're running, you're holding up the phone, thinking you're recording video, but in fact you're not. Is that fair to say? Yes, the video um, did not start until, and I've turned all this over, I'm sure you've reviewed it, Sure. but it did not start until just as I was arriving over Mr. Rosenbaum after he had been shot. So I don't know what happened in that period of time. I, I wasn't even looking at my phone. You know, usually when I'm recording, I'm, I'm constantly looking at what the video is recording to make sure that, you know, everything's in the frame and whatever. Um, but at that time, obviously, I was fixated on the situation in front of me rather than my phone, so I didn't realize that it wasn't recording. And I don't know what happened or why it started uh, later. What was it about the situation in front of you? You said you were fixated on it. What, what was it about the situation in front of you that, that focused your attention? Well, there, there were, um, we were running very quickly, number one. So I was just, just by virtue of the fact that I was running, uh, I was focused on that. But also, um, I knew having uh, seen Mr. Rittenhouse earlier and just using my eyes at that time that he was armed. Um, and also, uh, there was uh, a bag that was thrown by Mr. Rosenbaum. And so clearly there was like, you know, um, something about to happen. So I was paying attention to that. Did you ever see a weapon on Mr. Rosenbaum? I did not. Never saw a gun on Mr. Rosenbaum? I did not. Never saw him have a knife? Nope. Never saw him have a club or a bat or a chain or anything like that? I just saw the, the bag that was thrown. That was it. As the chase is occurring in the car source parking lot, did you hear, and again, I, I want you to go back to that moment. Yes. We've seen other videos. We've heard mm -hmm. other videos. So we have hindsight. But in that moment, mm -hmm. as you are following the chase behind Mr. Rosenbaum, behind Mr. Rittenhouse, did you hear Mr. Rosenbaum say anything? Um, there was a FU, um, and at the at the time in that instance, you know my recollection of it the night of it it was really hard for me to decipher, you know whether that was uh, who who yelled that. Um, after seeing the footage, it's very clear to me who yelled it. Well, okay, okay. And, let and me after, stop. Yeah. I, I don't want to. I want to. In that moment, yeah. I'm, I'm interested in your perceptions of the sounds around you. Oh. So I understand there's a lot going on, and, and mm -hmm. you know it's it's a scene. But put yourself back in that moment. Do you recall hearing Joseph Rosenbaum say anything? No. Do you hear the de re recall hearing the defendant? I mean, say I, I heard things said, but I don't recall it coming. You know, me perceiving it coming from him because. Um, like, for example, in that instance, there was a, uh, a pop, and then when Mr. Rittenhouse turned around, my focus was purely on uh, the, the barrel of the weapon and, and where that was going, so I, no, I didn't. Okay. Uh, in fact, when you were talking to the Kenosha Police Department after uh, this incident, and very shortly thereafter, mm -hmm. uh, you were asked if you heard any words exchanged between Mr. Rosenbaum and Mr. Rittenhouse. And you said no. You yeah, I mean, that? well, that, that was the phrasing of the of the question, which is, were there words exchanged? And so that would imply, you know, like some kind of conversation. Um, if they had have asked, did you hear uh, Mr. Rosenbaum yell anything? I might have phrased it differently because I just I just didn't focus on that uh, at the time. But the way that you know there was nothing exchanged. That's that's or that I saw. So let's continue. Uh, you just mentioned hearing a pop sound. Was that during this chase? That was uh, right before Mr. Rittenhouse turned around during the chase, yes. Okay, and uh, just to finish that thought up, you're talking about when Mr. Rittenhouse turns around and shoots Joseph Rosenbaum. Correct. Just before that, there was a, a pop sound. Correct. Again, we, with the benefit of hindsight. Yes. But let's put that aside. In that moment, as you are running, First of all, did you hear that pop as you I, were running? I did hear the pop, but um, given like the environment, it's not that uncommon to hear those kind of pops. So it, at that time, it was not clear to me that it was from a gun or what it was from. In fact, I, I did tell police that uh, it was my understanding that he turned around because he felt like uh, he was running into a corner because that, that area of the um, parking lot where the 
shooting actually took place was like there's the wall right here and then there was like cars parked kind of um so it it, it at night of it it appeared to me that he turned around because he uh had reached a dead end or something like that could you please pull up exhibit 25 Mr. McGinnis, we have, and I think I need to turn on the TVs again. Mr. McGinnis, there is a video on the screen which has already been introduced into evidence, and we've heard some testimony about it. Um, I don't. Have you ever seen this before? Um, I saw sc uh, screenshots of the this thermal footage. Okay. Uh, was that from yesterday or the day before during the trial? Yeah. Okay. Um, the there's been testimony that uh, there is an individual with a circle around them uh, identified as person of interest number one. That is Joseph Rosenbaum. There is a square around a second individual who is identified there as person of interest number two. That is the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. Mm -hmm. um, I, you will come into this video, if you're not already on it, uh, behind all of them. So I'll, I'm sure you'll be able to recognize yourself. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this forward a little bit so you can okay. see it. Um, I'd like you to pay attention to the movements of, every, of the three of you, Mr. Yep. Rosenbaum, yourself, and the defendant, and then I'll ask you a couple questions about it. Okay. So if we can play it forward, please. Let's pause it there, please. Um, were you able to see yourself on that video? Yes. Okay. And uh, it shows you, can we back up about 10 seconds, please? Um, go back a little bit further, please. 10, 10 more seconds. Okay, continue there. Go forward, please. Or play it, rather. Thank you. Possible, Mr. McGinnis, are you able to see yourself on that video at that very moment? Um, I think I'm one of the those two people. Okay. Let's con uh, let me continue forward, and uh, unfortunately it's that hard to tell. doesn't I work think on I'm the TV. Right, like, so, oh, gotcha. uh, let's continue forward, uh, and I'll pause in, in just a little bit here. Yeah, now I can see me. All right, yeah. pause. Uh, Mr. McGinnis, I've got a uh, Sister Marciana's uh, pointing device. <laughs> the judge has uh, allowed us to use. May I approach you? Could you please uh, use this and go to, up to that uh, screen in the corner, and can you point out yourself on that video? Um, I think it's hard to see right here, but uh, can you just go back for a sec? So yeah, why don't we rewind it? Right under the text. Yeah, we'll go, let's go back 10 seconds and play from there. And then Mr. McGinnis, just pause uh, when you see yourself, or raise your hand when you see yourself and we'll pause it, okay? Okay, uh, can you hold it up there one more second, please? I didn't quite see. Okay, so just for the record, if you are pointing to an area that is on the screen to the left of a vehicle that has, right or wrong, been referred to as a 
Duramax? Duramax. Is that a thing, a Duramax? It's a vehicle. Is it? Yeah. A Duramax vehicle. I know from other videos that this vehicle is parked in a way that the uh, hood of the vehicle is uh, to the lower left, or sorry, lower right of this uh, TV screen facing Sheridan Road. So if, if, if you'll accept that representation, then it, it, you're pointing to an area that is near the right, uh, or the, the rear passenger corner of that Duramax. Would that be fair to say? Uh, yeah. Let's continue the video forward, please. Pause. Can you use your uh, Miss Sister Marciana's pointer to uh, show us where you are? Okay, and you uh, just can you hold it up there for a second longer so we can make sure we all see it? Okay, that is you. Now, I, I can tell from that video that there appears to be uh, part of your body extended forward. Is that your arm holding the, the cell phone? Yes. Okay. Was that your right arm, if you recall? Um, usually it would be my right arm. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, thank you. That was good. Uh, you can leave that up there. That's fine. Thank you. You can go ahead and have a seat, please. Now, this is stopped uh, at a moment which is right around the time, I think we're maybe a, a frame or two before uh, Mr. Rittenhouse uh, fires and uh, the shots at Mr. Rosenbaum. Um, and everyone can see where you're at in relation to that. Yeah. What I want you would, uh, what I'd like you to do, Mr. Guinness, is tell the jury your, uh, in your own words, uh, what was going on at this particular moment. Uh, where we stopped in the um, video. So basically, I was running behind Mr. Rittenhouse and Mr. Rosenbaum, and um, I, like I mentioned before, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse turned around and Mr. Rosenbaum continued, and uh, I was continu continuing, uh, but then I realized you know, that they were about to basically collide. Um, and so uh, at that moment, um, I was still running, but just before the shots, I, I kind of altered my trajectory of my run a little bit uh, in the direction that I perceived to be uh, out of uh, harm's way. What do you mean harm's way? You you were several feet away from them. What, what was the harm to you? Well, um, once Mr. Rittenhouse turned around and Mr. Rosenbaum continued, it was a very short, very, very short period of time um, from when he turned around to uh, when um, the, f the shots were fired, and basically in that very short period of time, I realized that Mr. Rosenbaum was continuing to advance, and that uh, Mr. Rittenhouse uh, was standing still, and that they would be, um, uh, based on Mr. Rosenbaum's, uh, the way that he was running, and, and then eventually lunging towards the front portion of the rifle, um, it was clear to me that something with the weapon was about to happen, and I didn't want to be on the wrong side of that. When you say something with the weapon was about to happen, what do you mean? Well, it wasn't clear to me whether the weapon would be grabbed or, or fired or what exactly was going to happen, but it was clear to me that uh, it was a situation where it was, it was likely that um, something uh, dangerous was going to happen, what, be it Mr. Rosenbaum grabbing it, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse shooting it. I, I didn't know, but I knew that uh, my eyes at that moment were, like in this exact moment, were fixated on the barrel of the uh, weapon because I didn't want to end up uh, on the receiving end of that. You said your eyes were focused on the barrel of the weapon. Yes. Where was the barrel of the weapon pointed? Um, at, at this moment, when he stopped, it was aimed about 45 degrees at the ground. Did the aim of the barrel of the weapon change? It, it did. Um, and. When Mr. Rosenbaum lunged, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse uh, kind of dodged around, um, and then uh, that's when it was leveled at Mr. Rosenbaum and fired. What was the position of Mr. Rosenbaum's body when the defendant fired at him? Well, there were four shots, but at the, it was like in one continuous motion. It was like a lunge towards the front portion, a dodge around, and um, when he missed. 
um, his momentum continued forward. And I'm going to stop you for one second. Yeah. When he missed, who's he? Mr. Rosenbaum, I'm okay. sorry. Please yes. continue. Um, when Mr. Rosenbaum um, did not make contact with Mr. Rittenhouse, or it wasn't clear to me whether or not they made contact, but what was clear to me was that um, the trajectory of the rifle wasn't really altered by Mr. Rosenbaum's lunge. So if they did make contact, then it was um, just a glance. It wasn't enough to alter um, the trajectory of the rifle. But uh, and again, this is just because that was the only thing that I was looking at at that point. Um, and it's not clear to me whether uh, um, he, he basically fell forward, but can that I was as. I'm yeah. going to stop you for a second because you said he again. Can you oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Rosenbaum. Okay. Um, he fell forward. Y yes. Like it was, um, it was as if, you know, if you were to lunge at somebody, if anybody were to lunge, they'd probably stop themselves, you know, from falling face down on the ground, but the shots were fired in the exact instance that he was, his momentum was going forward, and that continued until Mr. Rosenbaum uh, landed on the ground. When Mr. Rosenbaum landed on the ground after being shot by the defendant, what was the, Mr. Rosenbaum's body position? Um, he was lying face down. Is it fair to say, if I'm understanding your testimony correctly, that when the defendant shot Mr. Rosenbaum, Mr. Rosenbaum was already falling forward? Uh, his moment, I wouldn't say falling, I would say his momentum was definitely going forward. It's not clear, you know, to me whether he would have, uh, I guess, fallen if, you know, the shots hadn't uh, been fired, but certainly his momentum was um, was in the forward direction and also uh, his hands were out in front of his feet uh, such that, you know, uh, his center of gravity was uh, beyond where his feet were. You gave an interview um, in which you characterized this incident as the defendant shooting Mr. Rosenbaum while Mr. Rosenbaum was falling. Do you recall saying that in, in, in an interview? Um, there were four shots, so um, I don't recall specifically saying that, but um, was that the direct quote? Let's put it up on the screen. Give you a few more minutes. Do you want to continue? Could we but just finish this little may, piece up and may, then I'll, I'll break? May. Can we play this uh, starting at the 52 second mark, please? Well, Tucker, I was just about 10 or 12 feet behind them as they ran into the parking lot. And what I saw was Rosenbaum pursuing Rittenhouse. And Rittenhouse turned around. Now, right before he turned around, I'm not sure if this was a reason why he turned around, but there was a gunshot. And that's actually visible on video. It's not clear whether or not that gunshot was fired into the air or towards Rittenhouse, but Rittenhouse did turn around immediately after that. And at that point, he went from running away to aiming his weapon at Rosenbaum, and I was actually directly behind Rosenbaum. So I took one or two steps to my right, right as Rosenbaum was lunging for the barrel of the rifle, and he was that close to him. And Rittenhouse actually took the barrel of the rifle and just dodged around. And at that point, as Rosenbaum was falling forward, he fired quickly four shots into Rosenbaum. And at that point, I was only about. We just played an excerpt from a video uh, interview that you did with Tucker Carlson on Fox News. Do you recall this interview? Yes. And the date of this interview is August 28, 2020. Yes. Does that sound about right? Mm -hmm. So that's three days after the event occurred. Is that, is that fair I to think, say? Uh, I think it was on a so it happened on a Tuesday, and I believe that that was Friday. Sure, three days later. Mm -hmm. um, fair to say that on Friday after this incident, your memory of it might be better than it is 14 months later? Um, it's just the same. I'm never going to forget it. I, generally speaking, people's memory is better when it's closer in time. You'd agree with that? Yeah. And you mentioned seeing some other videos before you gave this interview to Tucker Carlson. So you'd watch some things in those three days, correct? 
That is correct, yes. Okay. But in this video here, uh, you are telling uh, Fox News, Dr. Mm -hmm. Carlson, that the defendant shot Mr. Rosenbaum as Mr. Rosenbaum was falling forward, correct? Um, yeah, it's unclear to me because the shots were so quick uh, uh, whether you know, the shots are the reason why he, uh, because he lunged and then the shot was fired as he was lunging. So it was like, um, I guess, perhaps it was the shots that caused him to then, rather than stopping himself, um, just fall flat. That's not what you just said. Let's play this back about 20 seconds, please. For the barrel of the rifle, and he was that close to him. And Rittenhouse actually took the barrel of the rifle and just dodged around. And at that point, as Rosenbaum was falling forward, he fired quickly four shots into Rosenbaum. And Your interview three days after this incident says that Mr. Rosenbaum was already falling forward when the defendant used the gun and discharged the shots. I, I don't see why that's inconsistent with what I'm saying right now. He was, he was lunging, falling. Um, I would use those as synonymous terms in this situation because basically, you know, he threw his momentum towards the weapon, and when the weapon wasn't there, his momentum was continuing, and that's the point at which he fired. So if you use the word falling or lunging, it was his momentum was going forward, and that's the point at which he fired the shots. That's exactly what I'm getting at. A few seconds ago, you were saying that you weren't sure if Mr. Rosenbaum started to fall in because he was shot. But in your interview here, the falling is occurring before the defendant even shoots Mr. Rosenbaum. That's not what I, I said. According well, to your interview, let me cl Let me clarify. I said that I wasn't sure if he didn't catch himself because he was shot. Because you can lunge forward and then put your foot out and stop yourself from falling. So sure. it wasn't clear to me, you know, for example, if he had, if the shots had not have been fired, it's not clear to me whether he would have fallen or whether he would have caught himself. That's, that's what I meant when I said that. At any rate, your statement in this interview and what you're telling us here today in person is that Mr. Rosenbaum was already falling forward when the defendant shot him. Is that Yes, accurate? his momentum was going forward. I don't know, this term falling, I, I just wouldn't I'm, use that. So I'm you, not going to say that because that's not what I said. You actually have said that. I'm well, using your I'm words. not going to say that right now because I'm clarifying. Don't comment on the um, words. You're, it's it's correct. It was a live can, interview. No, no. You can ask questions, but don't comment on the witness's testimony. Fair enough. Um, at any rate, whether it's the momentum, falling, however you want to put it, mm -hmm. Mr. Rosenbaum was in that motion. Yes. Before the defendant shot him. Yes. Okay. We can take a break now, Your Honor. All right, um, let's take a break. Folks, uh, please don't talk about the case during the break. Uh, read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Uh, any questions, anybody? Okay, thank you. Um, oh, I didn't even tell them that. I usually keep it a secret, and then uh, they eat faster. But um, I, uh, I was going to say about 1230, but if you have somewhere, it's something you have to do or something. Okay, uh, let's aim for 12.30. And hope that I can get my haircut moved up.
is it doing that? Oh, I know why. Sorry, guys, we'll be here in about a minute, Your Honor. Sure. Would you come down, please? Yes. You need some more water? Oh, no, sir. Oh. They thought they were in a different courtroom because they didn't recognize me. Because <laughs> you All right, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, the answer to your question is yes. And uh, it's a number one buzz is what it's called. But can anybody tell me why they'd call it a partial? Why would they call that a partial? OK, go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. McGinnis. We're going to continue where we left off this morning. You were describing the. Uh, situation where the defendant shot Mr. Rosenbaum. <clears throat> I want to um, talk about where you were at at that location and what was going on through your mind. Um, earlier, I think you said your eyes were focused on the barrel of the gun. Is that fair to say? That's Yes. <clears throat> when you saw what was going on in front of you between Mr. Rittenhouse and Mr. Rosenbaum, uh, what was going through your mind at that moment? Well, um, at, the, at the point at which uh, Mr. Rittenhouse turned around and Mr. Rosenbaum was continuing to advance, um, that's when I realized that they were going to, uh, I guess, collide or meet, or, but it was clear based on um, the speed with which Mr. Rosenbaum was running and uh, um, obviously what was uh, shouted beforehand that, you know, uh, they weren't coming together to have a friendly meeting. Um, and given that Mr. Rittenhouse was armed, um, I became extremely worried um, because I was behind Rosenbaum that I was going to be um, caught uh, in the, whatever was about to happen. Did you feel like you were positioned in the line of fire? Um, I did, and that's why I altered my trajectory slightly um, as the shots were being fired. 
when those shots were being fired, uh, did anything happen to you? Uh, n what exactly do you mean by that? Did, did you get hit? Nope. Did you feel at, the mo at that moment like you had gotten hit? Um, well, I told the police the night of um, because they were asking me, you know, where my eyes were. So as they were, uh, as Rosenbaum was lunging forward, uh, my eyes were on the gun. But as the shots, uh, when the shots were fired, I, I did actually change my, um, I, I looked down at my legs because um, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult for me to say whether it was a, a sound or a sensation, but there was a, uh, um, feeling sound that something went past my legs and I looked down and then I looked back up um, and I actually like stepped my feet to make sure that they were I was fine you told the defect detective that you felt something on your leg and you first your first thought was that you had been shot correct I, I was I was worried of that absolutely um, I, I again I, I'm not sure um, whether it was something that actually, you know, uh, actually contacted my pants or whether it was just the, you know, sensation sound, but it caused me to look down and I did, um, you know, stamp my legs to make sure that they felt okay. Did you feel that the defendant's actions of turning around and pointing the gun and discharging those rounds put you in danger? Um... I would say that, uh, given where I was, uh, certainly I was I was in danger. Yes. <clears throat> After the, let me back up one second. We've talked a lot about Mr. Rosenbaum's actions towards Mr. Rittenhouse, and I just want to clarify one uh, uh, part of that. At any point, did you see Mr. Rosenbaum touch the defendant's gun? I, I, it's hard for me to say whether he actually uh, made contact with the gun, but um, what I can say is that they were extremely close and that um, the, if, if he did, then it didn't alter the trajectory of the weapon. Um, so if he did, it wasn't like you know, he got a hand on it. It was maybe barely grazed it, but they were, they were very close. And it was um, actually, uh, since I was behind him, it, you know, his body was partially obstructing um, the barrel of the of the gun at that time. So it's hard for me to say definitively whether or not he actually made contact, but it, um, not that I saw. Um, I couldn't, couldn't say definitively. I couldn't hear the last sentence. Oh, um, which part? The last sentence. Uh, I, I couldn't say definitively whether or not uh, there was contact made. We know from all the videos, from all the evidence, Mr. Rittenhouse fires four rounds. Uh, you testified earlier Mr. Rosenbaum winds up face down on the ground, correct? Correct. What did you do then? Um, well, I, uh, after the shots were fired, um, there, was, uh, other, there were other shots that were going off. And at this point, I'm aware of the fact that, you know, that's probably gunfire. Um, Mr. Rittenhouse, in, from my perspective, had run away, um, and Mr. Rosenbaum was lying behind a car. And so I knew that he was, given the shots were fired at such close range that he had to have been hit, um, and he was lying lifeless on the ground. And so I saw him behind the car, and I, I um, saw it as both a, both a place that I could get safety but also help him. And um, so I, I ran over. Uh, I said something along the lines of, uh, are you okay? I'm going to flip you over slowly. And uh, then I, f I flipped him over. And uh, at that point, um, other people were arriving. And um, um, that's, you know, basically all the rest is on video. But uh, we were trying to, I, I presume that there were, you know, given the, the weapon that he was using, that there had to be uh, big wounds. And um, as people arrived, we were looking for those. Uh, and then uh, somebody shouted that there was a hospital across the street, at which point um, I told one individual to grab his other arm. And um, we uh, 
carried him across the street. Uh, should I just continue with? Uh, let me let me stop okay. you there for a second. Um, can we please play uh, Exhibit 19? 19? Is it hard for you to see that? I, I certainly don't like to watch it. I understand. Um, I wanted to show that to you because there's a moment after the shooting where you are taking your shirt off. Um, why did you do that? Because I presume that um, given how close they were that he had been hit and that um, uh, my dad was an ER doctor and you know if something's bleeding you apply pressure so that was the goal with uh, doing that. We see in the video that the defendant runs around the cars and comes close to you. And again, like I said earlier, we're going to try and go mm -hmm. back to that moment in time. I yes. know benefit of hindsight. But at that particular moment as you're standing there next to Mr. Rosenbaum's body, did you know that was the defendant? I did not. What did you think was going on with that figure um, next to you? Well, the way that I saw it from like it was kind of a tunnel vision situation. So I was looking at Mr. Rosenbaum on the ground and attempting to find where the wounds were. And um, it was like a pair of legs arrived next to me from my peripheral vision. And I just screamed, call 911. And then I saw a hand reach into the pocket. Um, and I assumed that that was what was happening. Um, and actually, when I got up, um, I did. Uh, watching the video after the fact, I was facing Mr. Rittenhouse, but uh, given that I was in the process of removing my shirt, I was actually looking at the ground, and I, I, um, I told the police night, I, I didn't even, I actually remember the moment the next morning that I realized that that was Mr. Rittenhouse um, when I saw the video. If you had known in that moment that that was Mr. Rittenhouse, would you have felt in danger? I think um, I felt in danger anyways, um, but I certainly, I think, would have maybe changed my tone of voice. Um, I can't really imagine what I would have done, uh, but um, I mean, I was, I was afraid in that moment anyways, uh, so it's hard for me to say. The individual who you sensed next to you, we now know the defendant, you said he pulled out his phone. I just saw his hand go into his pocket, and that, like from my perspective, that's all that I saw. And I assume that, you know, that was, 
you know, I had said call 911, hand went into the pocket. I assume that that was what was happening. Did you hear the defendant say anything? Apologize, but I, 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 I need to show it. I'm sorry. You okay? Just don't move, man. Don't move. All right, I'm gonna. Can I flip you over real quick? Oh. I'm gonna flip you over real quick, bro. Here, can flip, flip over real quick. Just gotta get pressure on this, dude. Where's it at? Where is it? Where is it? Turn around. Where's it at, dude? Get a light on it. Get a light. Give me a fucking light. Put pressure on it. Put fucking pressure on it. Where? Where, dude? Where? Where's the hole? Get the fucking mask off. just watched was one you were recording, correct? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> Earlier you described holding your phone up as the chase is going on and the phone wasn't set to record video. Mm -hmm. At what point did you realize that and make the, the a switch? I have, I have no idea. Okay. I have no clue. Um, I don't know how it went from photo to record. Um, and I don't know how it started at that particular moment. I actually, um, I did uh, call my CEO of my company uh, immediately afterwards from the hospital and told him that I had recorded a homicide. Um, and then I looked at my phone and I realized that it wasn't recording at the time. <clears throat> I think you testified a little bit ago and I, I wanna pick up where you left off that um, you attempted to treat Mr. Rosenbaum, uh, and then there's a process by which he is uh, carried over to the hospital. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Can you tell us about your involvement in that process? Um, well, uh, my hand was on his head, and I was under his right uh, shoulder. Um, there was another individual under his left shoulder, and then there were uh, maybe one or two people uh, carrying his legs. and. Um, we ran across the street, and there was somebody who uh, told us that he worked at the hospital and that we should put him in the car to get him there quicker, at which point he opened the tailgate. Um, and uh, there, we loaded him into the back of the car, and uh, it was there were people actually, um, there's a large crowd around the back of the car, couldn't close the tailgate. And uh, so we told, we just said, screw the, uh, forget the tailgate. Uh, and we drove down um, a small ramp. Um, and at that point, I was alone in the back with Mr. Rosenbaum. And I was just telling him that we're going to have a beer together afterwards and it was all going to be okay. And um, um, uh, that once we arrived, the, the had to, a gate had to go up. And we went through the gate, 
and that was like right next to the ER and um, I helped um, some medical uh, personnel came out with a gurney and then I helped them load it on load him onto the gurney and then they took him uh, into the hospital we've seen the video that you recorded at Mr. Rosenbaum's body there's another video uh, that we were watching before that of someone else approaching the scene it appears to me in the videos that at least at the beginning Mr. Rosenbaum has his eyes open was he ever responsive to you um uh i i i believe that uh when i was talking to him in the vehicle um i like to think that he could hear me it seemed that his eye was looking at me um but it was kind of rolling back and then um when i started talking it rolled back kind of towards me and i was looking at him um so I, I, I'm not sure if he heard me, but um, I think perhaps he did. Did he say anything? No. He was having difficulty even uh, breathing. And just so we're clear, I, from, the, from the moment you came upon his body after the shooting until the end, did you ever hear Mr. Rosenbaum say anything at all? No. After you helped the hospital personnel get him on a gurney, did you stay at the hospital for a while after that? Yes. Um, I was, uh, number one, covered in blood. And number two, I didn't have a shirt. And the police actually locked down the hospital. Um, my coworkers, Shelby and Jorge, came to the hospital, and actually Shelby literally offered me the shirt off her back um, so that I could... Um, you know, not be conspicuous if I tried to leave. But then the police said, you're going to, you know, um, yeah, can you come to the station? I mean, it wasn't really an ask. It was more of a, you're coming to the station. But, you know, I, I had already talked with my mom and my CEO, and I was resolute and cooperating fully with the police. So I said, whatever you guys need me to do. And I stayed at the hospital for maybe an hour or 40 minutes before a squad car came got me and uh, there was actually a detective or a, um, a uniformed police officer who asked me some questions while I was at the hospital and I gave him my phone. While you were at the hospital, uh, did you see any other uh, folks that had been shot or injured that night? I, I did. I saw um, Mr. Uh, Grosswitz. Grosswitz? Grosswitz. Um, Where did you see him at? Uh, so. Right after I loaded Mr. Rosenbaum onto the gurney, within before I could even grasp what was happening, um, he came in to the there were like the doors that we came in were um, on one side of the hospital, but then there were like the emergency room sliding doors, like the public access, and and he came in through there with an officer, and um, he was holding his arm, and I saw his arm. Can you describe what you saw? It was. Uh, his bicep was effectively gone uh, and there was just a lot of blood can you tell us in your own words how you were feeling at that moment um, I it was just surreal it was um, I felt um, scared about uh, what was going to happen, um, what I would have to do um, after that, because I knew, you know, that I had what I had seen. I, I was, I became more worried once I realized that my phone uh, wasn't recording. Why do you say that? Um, because. Um, that made me realize that I, it was my eyes that saw it, and that um, rather than just um, being able to show, I'd have to tell. Like you're doing today? Yes. I have nothing further.
after you left the hospital, you went to the Kenosha Police Department, correct? Yes. And you were interviewed shortly after this happened um, by a detective, Sepris. Yes. And that's not either of these two individuals here, correct? No. And you gave them a video taped and sound recorded statement, correct? Correct, yes. And that was in a room with a small table and carpeted walls? Yes. And you stated to Detective Sepris, and I'm quoting from your interview, the guy who I interviewed was trying to evade him. When you're using the term guy who you interviewed, who are you referring to? Mr. Rittenhouse. Okay. And he was trying to evade whom? Mr. Uh, well, uh, it depends on what instance you're talking about, but uh, initially it was very difficult for me to tell who he was evading um, because it was, the street was dark and I was a ways back. Um, uh, there were a number of individuals kind of moving in his direction, uh, and there was a lot of noise, so uh, it wasn't clear to me who he was evading initially uh, when he started to run. Okay, but you used the word him, which would be singular. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Um, I, I believe that in that same statement, though, I, I said that there were a couple of individuals, including the man who was shot. I'll read from your statement at page 20. And there were other people who were moving very quickly, and I noticed two guys who were moving quickly. One of the ones was the guy who ended up, I guess, getting shot and dying, and they were moving towards him. So he was, according to what I saw, trying to evade these individuals. Yes. Okay, so one of the individuals is the guy who gets shot, Mr. Rosenbaum. Correct. And the other one is somebody who, to this day, you would not know who it is. No, yeah, it was, it was dark. and. Um, it was, it was very difficult to identify. Um, I, I don't think I could, no. And you had interviewed Kyle before this shooting maybe 15 minutes? It was like 14. Okay. Yeah. I'm off of I, I, had the, I had the metadata okay. in my phone, so okay. according to the metadata on the phone, it was about 14 minutes. Okay. And when you met Kyle and you interviewed him, he was not menacing to you, was he? Um, beyond that he had a weapon, no. Okay, so what was menacing was the weapon. When I, when I said um, menacing in that context, it was the situation that was menacing, which is a number of armed individuals. And specifically uh, in that instance, I was most uh, nervous about the individuals on the roof because I couldn't see them. Um, so. It's, it was just more concerning to me because at least, you know, the folks on the ground, I could see them. Okay. And Kyle was one of the ones on the ground. Yes. And the interview which Mr. Binger took from and referred to the menacing word was you being interviewed by a Kyle Horton, and that interview was 26 minutes long, correct? Mm-hmm. And you used the word menacing once. Um, I guess so. You went through it. <laughs> so... <laughs> Take your word for it, but I don't recall saying it another time. Okay. And this is your word um, to Detective Separus. No, no, it's cool, it's cool, but he did. I mean, the interview, he was very cordial. Detective, yeah, you, very nice and almost seemed like innocent. Very, almost seemed like too much for his own good. Do you remember that statement? Yes, I do. And you're referring to him being too innocent for his own good, correct? I was, uh, I was alluding to the fact that uh, it seemed to me that a lot of the people, um, uh, protesters, rioters, whatever you want to call them, were uh, casting negative looks in his direction, and he, wasn't, um, he didn't seem to be aware of that. Meaning Kyle wasn't aware of how the people not how, how pissed group. off the the people were uh, not in his group it just the group the uh, generally speaking the people who were on the ground who had just been you know basically volleyed back by the law enforcement those people not so not not the other armed individuals 
the rioters didn't like the people with long weapons. Is that a fair statement? The way you that's perceive a, that. That's a fair statement in my perception, yes. I think it was also additionally that um, uh, I was referring to the fact that he was uh, shouting medical and that people um, were looking at him negatively, um, kind of like angry uh, when they heard you know, him and then saw his, I guess, presume his weapon or whatever I, it, it was that made them mad. I didn't mean to cut you off, oh. I apologize. That's where you talked about the duality of a medic having a gun, correct? Correct. Okay. And he might not have perceived the problem with that dual role based upon your conversations with him. Um, yeah, he might not have perceived how other people perceived uh, him in that situation. Okay. Reading from a statement from you. I didn't know. I don't know if it was the fire extinguisher or if it was a piece of metal or something kick something. I have no idea. But when I turn back, the fire extinguisher is gone, and he had the AR-15 kind of like aiming downwards. And at that point, they were heading into the parking lot. And he was kind of facing backwards, and the individual who got shot was advancing towards him, and he actually dodged. He dodged around. And then he ran backwards, so he almost like he turned his back a little bit. You're describing him running away from Mr. Rosenbaum there, correct? Correct. And as Mr. Rose Rittenhouse is running away from him, Mr. Rosenbaum is in pursuit, correct? Correct. And at one point, Kyle turns around with a weapon, and you're talking about it being in a downward position but towards Mr. Rosenbaum. Um, yes. Are you talking about the final instance where he turned around? Or the first instance. Yes. Okay. And this isn't where Mr. Rosenbaum gets shot, correct? Correct. That was, um, he was kind of up on the curb, um, and uh, he, he kind of headed in the direction towards the car lot, and then he stopped and turned. Uh, and then he continues running, and Mr. Rosenbaum continues to chase Mr. Rittenhouse. Uh, correct. Didn't he it, see... I didn't uh, mean to cut you off. No, this. not at all. Um, uh, the, the, the instance where I described that there were two individuals, that was kind of at that point in time. So it, it, I didn't zero in on Mr. Rosenbaum being kind of the, the one person pursuing him until after that first kind of juke and run. Okay. And do you remember Mr. Rittenhouse turning around in the parking lot when Mr. Rosenbaum is chasing him, just Mr. Rosenbaum chasing him? Yes. Okay, and this is before the final confrontation. Um, when he turned around initially, he was kind of on the sidewalk before they got into the lot, and that was when it wasn't clear that Mr. Rosenbaum was the sole, because it was very dark. So it, it, perhaps, I mean, I, I'm assuming that that was him, but also like I was fumbling with my phone at that juncture and I was hanging up with Shelby. That was kind of all happening in that simultaneous moment. So it's hard. I, I didn't identify Mr. Rosenbaum until we kind of entered the lot where it was very light. Okay. Like, well, and lit. when he enters the lot, Mr. Rosenbaum, it's Kyle and Mr. Rosenbaum really in that area where the shooting occurred. There's nobody else. Yes, correct. And he runs according to your vantage point, basically as far as he can. Um, yeah, I did state to the police the night of that um, it appeared that um, when he stopped, he entered an area where there was like a car parked and a wall. Um, I mean, it would have been conceivable that, you know, you could have, the, the car was like not, it wasn't up against the wall. Like you could conceivably have continued, but it, it seemed to me, uh, my perception that night that he, um, you know, had entered a bit of a dead end, um, and, or at least he, felt that way. And he turned and looks at Mr. Rosenbaum. Correct. And Mr. Rosenbaum knows that he's chasing an armed individual, correct? I'm going to object, Your Honor, it's speculation. He's seen the gun. You know, it, it is, you know, we uh, you I, don't know what he okay. saw. I, I'll ask it this way. Okay. Mr. Rittenhouse turns around, has a firearm in his arms, hands, correct? Correct. The AR, as we refer correct. to it. Correct, yes. Mr. Rosenbaum is running towards Kyle Rittenhouse, correct? Correct. And 
there's nothing between those two individuals to block Mr. Rosenbaum's view, correct? Correct. Could have stopped at any time once he sees an armed individual, correct? I assume he could have, yes. He kept advancing. Correct. And he continues to advance until he makes a lunge for the weapon, correct? Yes, it appeared that he was lunging for the front portion of the, of the weapon. Okay, which would be the business end of an AR-15. Yes. And you know as you sit here today that he yelled the words F you, but the whole words, correct? Yes. Okay, what was the tone of his voice as he yelled that? Very angry. As he goes at Kyle Rittenhouse, correct? Correct. And there's been some statements about him shot in the back. Don't dispute it. If you're Mr. Rittenhouse and I'm Mr. Rosenbaum, did you ever see him turn away from you back to Mr. Rittenhouse? No. Okay. And your vantage point would, you, would allow you to see if, in fact, this is the proverbial shooting an innocent person in the back, correct? Um, for, you mean, was I close enough? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Okay. And as he shot, you never saw him turn around, look at you directly, and begin running away for the back shot, correct? Correct. You to the detective that evening describing the confrontation between Rosenbaum and Kyle Rittenhouse. In my best estimation, I think this individual and possibly other individuals decided they were going to get his gun from him, correct? I'm going to object to that. It calls for speculation. <clears throat> it's his belief. Well, I, 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 <clears throat> you can explore. <clears throat> what appeared to him to have happened, but uh, when you say belief, <clears throat> people don't talk the way lawyers want them to. Um, the lawyer, lawyers want very strict adherence to just perception by the senses. In ordinary discourse, people don't talk that way. They combine a whole array of things that they see and perceive with all of their senses and their experience in life. And then they put that into the form of an impression. And now the lawyers, and I'm not singling out one lawyer or another, uh, lawyers typically, they want, well, just the, as was referred to earlier, just the facts. Um, I'm going to let the witness testify as one would ordinarily discourse with others, but keep in mind there is a, there's a huge component of things other than what he perceived with his senses, and then I'll let the uh, state uh, uh, redirect on, the, on those issues, but he can answer the question. Okay, I'll read the statement to you, and then I'll ask you why you believed it or why you thought that, okay? okay. Yep. But in my best estimation, I think that the individual and possibly other individuals decided that they were going to get his gun from him. Do you remember telling Detective Sepperson? I do, yes. What was that statement based upon? Um, it, was, it was based upon uh, the way that they were advancing towards him. Um, it seemed that they um, were moving, trying to move quickly such that um, they could catch, catch him. Okay. And from your vantage point, remembering back to that evening, did you see that Kyle Rittenhouse was with anyone that was friendly to him that night? That night? At, at that time. At that, at that moment, no. Um, um, Mr. Bulch uh, was with him when I was walking behind them, and then after uh, I saw um, Yellow Pants guy, uh, that was the last I saw Mr. Bulch. So he was alone uh, okay. after that. Statement from you to the detective. 
And it is very clear from the moment I focused on that situation between those two that the unarmed guy, the unarmed guy got shot, was trying to get his gun. And do you remember making that statement? Yes, I do. Okay. And what is that statement based on? Um, that was based on the, the motion of him um, uh, running and reaching for the front portion of the rifle. Okay. And that evening, you told the detective he paused so it looked like he was very close. You used the word very close. What does that mean to you? Um, well, I was behind uh, Mr. Rosenbaum, and uh, Mr. Rittenhouse was on the other side of me and Rosenbaum. And so um, they, it was clear that they, as he lunged forward, they, they almost made contact. It wasn't clear if they did or not. But um, very close just meaning like close enough to just reach out and okay. touch and your someone. And your perception was that evening, as you watched it, he was going for the barrel of the gun. Correct. And the detective followed up on that to pin that down, and you stated, but he was certainly trying to grab the barrel of the gun. You were certain of that that night. I'm going to raise my objection again. This is speculation. I, I, and I'll repeat my same statement that I made to the jury. There, there, there certainly is an element of conclusion uh, in the witness's answer, but that's the way people talk in ordinary discourse and convey information one to another. So they have to weigh it in terms of its reliability, uh, knowing that it's not, it not like a series of photographic images, so overruled. I, I think it was very clear to me that he was reaching specifically for the weapon and um, um, because that's where his hands went. Okay. And your statement to the detective, yeah, so it was like he, the guy he shot was like this, and then he was probably, and he leaned in, so he was like this. And so at that time he was shot, he was kind of leaning forward. You were describing to the detective what you observed Mr. Rosenbaum doing, correct? Correct. Could you describe that or show us? Um, it, I mean, it's probably easier to show, to Please. be honest. Um, He's in a low position running, and then um, when he went for the front portion of the rifle, his uh, he lunged forward like that. Okay, so you've shown somebody in the tack position, you lunge forward and putting both of your arms out, and you're saying going for the barrel. Uh, I would say he was more like kind of in an athletic position, like you would if you were, you know, like running as fast as you could, um, and then. I'm sorry, could you repeat the second part? So he's running as fast as he could, mm -hmm. and then you showed both of your arms going out almost like I don't know, a Superman? It was like a little bit, um, I mean, I think Superman would be kind of you know, straight out. It was more like out and down because the rifle was aimed um, like it was lower than where his hands were, so his hands were actually going kind of downward as well. Uh, and towards the barrel. When he goes for the barrel, what does Kyle do with the gun? Uh, he dodged around it. And then does what? And then leveled the, the weapon and fired. And it, it wasn't necessarily leveled because uh, Mr. Rosenbaum was in a lower position, so it was, it was still somewhat angled towards the ground, but it was, uh, it, uh, you know, leveled at his body. Okay. Do you, this exchange ask you if you remember it that's the only reason why i say that there were more people involved detective okay in trying to corner this guy or whatever detective uh-huh because i just heard a lot of yelling and a lot of really fast movement that's more talking about what you observed at the beginning correct correct yes but you thought this was a group of people at least two trying to get kyle's gun from him when he's alone um, in, in, 
if I were to, um, I mean, I believe that I was, I was speculating that that's what they were trying to do based on what I saw. Okay. And the shots that you heard, there's a shot and then there's Kyle shots, correct? Correct. The shot that you hear first, can you say whether it's in front of you, behind you, to the side of you? Um, so, like, um, there's like the building, that's the actual building in that lot. Um, that's to my right as I'm running. And um, Mr. Rosenbaum and Mr. Rittenhouse are in front of me. And it was like to my left. Okay. So, as you're adva advancing, it would be from the area of the sidewalk. Correct. And you've looked at numerous videos now, not that day, but mm -hmm. since, and you actually see the flash of gunfire. Correct. Your statement, getting towards the end, and it was pretty clear to me that the guy with the gun was trying to evade the other guy, and that's throughout this event until he stops. Yes, that's, a, that's an accurate statement. He did not want to be caught by Mr. Rosenbaum. Uh, that is correct. And when he finally did turn and point the gun, Rosenbaum kept fire, kept advancing. Correct. And Kyle Rittenhouse had no way of knowing that this was a three-person grouping. In other words, him, Rosenbaum, you. Is that a fair statement? I'm going to object, Your Honor. I don't know how this witness could testify as to what Kyle Rittenhouse knew or did not know. Well, his actual question was not what he knew, but rather whether he had, he said he asked whether, or he said he had no way of knowing. Um, I, I, I think I'd be more comfortable if you rephrased your question. To your knowledge, did Kyle Rittenhouse know that you were behind Mr. Rosenbaum? I'm going to object, Your Honor. I don't know how this witness would know what Kyle Rittenhouse knew. It's a complete speculation as to the defendant's state of mind. Um, overall, well, I, 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 I think it would need to be phrased in terms of did the physical circumstances suggest that Mr. Rittenhouse would have been in a position to know. Sir, would Mr. Kyle Rittenhouse been in a position to know that you were behind Mr. Rosenbaum? Um, he was certainly close enough, but uh, I wasn't looking at where he was looking. I was looking, uh, like I said, at that point at the um, front portion of the weapon. Um, uh, it was quite light in that area, so it's it's very possible that I, I mean, I'm, I'm, if he had have been looking in my direction, he certainly would have seen me. But he's running away from where you are until he turns, and he has this guy coming at him, correct? Correct. And if Mr. Rosenbaum had stopped five or seven feet away from him, would he have been shot? Now, earlier there was, well, I'll go a little bit further. You get, you're giving aid to Mr. Rosenbaum after he's been shot four times. Were those shots slow, bang, 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 or were they in quick succession? It was, ex it was extremely quick. Um, the night of, I said it was three or four, because it was so quick that it was hard for me to count. And we now everyone agrees it's four, and you do too? Yes. Okay. And after he shot, you pick him up and you try to carry him to the hospital, but you stop at a vehicle, correct? Correct. 
what's happening to you as you're stopping or trying to get him to this vehicle? What's happening to you? Um, well, there was a very large crowd around us. Uh, everyone was yelling. Um, I was getting bumped, and I thought that um, I was uh, just being bumped by the crowd. But then, you know, I got bumped a little bit harder, and then I felt a fist hit my face um, as I was loading him into the back of the vehicle. Okay, sir, I felt what in my face? A fist. So there was, there's a large Greek group of people surrounding you and the other individual carrying Mr. Roosevelt into the car. Yes. And people in that crowd were striking at you? Uh, I can only identify the one person because, again, I, I, th I thought it for I had a lot of adrenaline and I thought I didn't think it was anything beyond getting, you know, in being in a, um, a mob, a crowd of people who were all, you know, I guess very animated. Um, a lot of people were yelling. Uh, and I didn't really feel it until uh, it was like a, a hard punch to the side of my face. Um, and I turned around and saw the individual, uh, and he was pointing at me um, like he wanted, um, he was mad at me. Like he wanted more punches at you. Is that it? Yeah, I, I, at that point, I was actually just entering the rear of the vehicle. And so he hit me, and I looked back, and I, um, I actually, like, kicked my legs um, towards where he was at the tailgate uh, to get him away from me. Thank you. And you go to that interview, and they're very interested in your phone, correct? Correct. You are told that they're either going to take your phone and get a search warrant, or you'll give consent, correct? Correct. And you don't want to give up everything in your phone because it's your job and your livelihood. Is that a fair statement? I didn't want to lose possession of my phone because it is my livelihood, yes. Okay. Did they tell you they weren't going to go into your phone because of Marcy's Law? I don't recall that. If somebody said that, you'd remember that, correct? Yeah, what they said was, um, can we take your phone to download uh, the videos? And I, I gave it to them. I don't um, recall anything about Marcy's Law. They told you if you didn't give them consent, they were going to get a search warrant, correct? That, that is correct, yes. And you were not written a curfew ticket, correct? Um, that's correct. I was not written one. Now, you also testified about how at this riot, demonstration, whatever you want to call it, there were more firearms than you had seen at other places, correct? Um, yes. Well, I, I would say the most firearms was probably Seattle, but yes. Okay. Portland. You can't open carry or you'll be arrested, correct? I believe so. New York, you can't open carry or you'll be arrested. That's for sure. For sure. Yes. Washington, D.C., can't open carry or you'll be arrested. Correct. Wisconsin, you can open carry. Correct. I, you know so that makes, I yeah, yes. that makes for a prevalence of guns. Yes. And the, I believe the same in, in Seattle as well. And. The second night of the riots, you came to Kenosha and you saw the car source lot with all the cars, not the one where the shooting happened, but the one right below your hotel burn. Yeah, it was burning every night. Okay. But that was the night where most all of the cars went out. Are you referring to Monday night? Yes. Yes. Okay. The night before the shooting, you're saying? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry to make myself clear. Monday night, the first car source lot with maybe 30, 40 cars goes up. Yes. Okay. And the fire department didn't come? Uh, that was when we inter we interviewed the individuals with the power washer and the um, buckets of water. Uh, I didn't see, I mean, I saw um, the fire department responding to a different fire um, at a, a furniture store, um, but not in front of that lot. Okay. And that's the night where some cars got put on fire at Car Source 2, and they were trying to put it out with a power washer and I think buckets? Like literally uh, buckets and trash cans. Of okay. Water. And that was citizens, not the fire department. That's correct. <coughs> and when, and then I'll end, you had no fear or problem from Kyle or Mr. Balch when you went out on that patrol with him? 
Um, I would say that I was certainly fearful just in a general sense, um, given that there were weapons and that it was a chaotic environment. Were you fearful of Mr. Balch and Mr. Rittenhouse? Um, at the time that I was walking with them? Yes. Uh, I was fearful of the potentiality that, um, you know, those weapons would be used. Um, so I would say, like, I was elevated in terms of my um, assessment of the risk involved in the situation. Um, but I wouldn't say that I was specifically uh, um, fearful of them uh, individually. I was okay. fearful of what might happen. You're fearful of the situation in Kenosha on August 25th, 2020, all the armed people, the rioting, the chaos, and the social unrest. And the guns, yeah. And the guns. Yeah. And both sides had guns. Um, I actually didn't see, uh, I know after seeing video, I, I, I do see that now, but the only uh, armed individuals that I saw that night were in front of the, the business. Okay. Thank you, I have nothing further. Can we play, uh, can we have exhibit 25 ready, please? Mr. McGinnis, I have an exhibit up on the screen, which is the Exhibit 25. We've shown this to you before. Um, I've heard you testify that you were, um, well, let me ask you this. Is it, is it fair to say that at the moment this video is paused at, as we see on that screen, um, you are not yet on the screen? Is that fair to say? Um, I think, yeah, I think, I think that sounds Right, I think I was just uh, off the screen to the right, up the street. And you've talked about your perception of person of interest number two, which is the one with the square around them, that is the defendant, and what you believe was going on when he arrived at the car source lot. And you've talked about one or more individuals that are after him, he's having to evade them, things like that. Um, there's been some testimony about that, correct? Correct. You've already acknowledged that you were further back, it was dark, it was hard for you to see exactly. Is that fair to say? That's fair, yes. Okay. What I'd like to do now, Mr. McGinnis, is I'm going to have this video played, and I would like you to pay attention to that area. And we have person of interest number one identified, that is Joseph Rosenbaum. Um, other than him, I would like it if you would point out for us the other individual or individuals that you saw chasing the defendant or, or trying to corner him or, or somehow running after him or, or however you want to describe it. The other individuals that were involved that you believe you saw. Is that, do you understand what I'm getting at? Yeah, I, I would say, um, I wouldn't say chasing. I would say it was like they were directing their attention in his direction and, and moving towards him. Okay. Um, but it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't like a dead sprint chase or anything like that. However you want to put it, I'm not quibbling, uh, but... Whatever those people are, if you could please, uh, that little wooden pointer yeah. in front of you. Um, let us know when you see them. We'll pause and then you can point them out for us. Does that sound okay? Okay. Okay, let's go forward, thanks. It was, um, it's the, the, so basically it's the individuals like in the middle of the street Okay, can we pause? <clears throat> okay, uh, do you want us to go back a little bit? Um, sure. Let's go back 10 seconds. Because there was a crowd in the middle of the street, but they're basically on the side of the sidewalk. 
why don't you, yeah, please point at it for us. Okay, so you're, you're circling uh, a group of people that are near the sidewalk in front of car source. Um, how, are you able to count how many people there are there? Uh, do you want us to go back any further, or is this far enough for you to, to show us what you're referring that's, to? That's, yeah, that's, I mean, it was just this group right here. Okay. Um, and there was some, also, I mean, it's hard to tell here, but like there were just there was just a, a group here in the street, and then I, I believe it, like I said, it was dark. It was hard to say. There was shouting coming from this direction. So. Can we please uh, play the uh, video forward a little bit? Pause, please. Okay, I will, yeah. Um, the uh, Madam Court Reporter has asked if we can make sure that you have the microphone oh, close. I, yes. I, know, I know I asked you to go up there, so that's yep. my fault. Um, what I'd like to do, if we could, um, is rewind uh, 20 seconds, please. Okay, and um, I don't know if I can phrase this easily, Mr. McGinnis. I don't know how to put it. Are you, do you feel like you would be able to point out any folks other than Mr. Rosenbaum that are moving towards the defendant um, or uh, running after him or, or in it? I know you said it, their attention, and that can mm -hmm. mean many things. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm interested in physical movements. Are you able to point out any individuals that moved physically towards the defendant other than Mr. Rosenbaum? Um, you, do you want to play it again? Yeah, let's I, play it again. And, and I'd like you to keep an eye, well, before we start playing, I'm going to ask you, Mr. McGinnis, if you could please try and keep an eye on that for us and let us know if you see any of those folks, maybe you can point them out for us. I'm, I'm interested in physical movements towards the defendant. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, let's go ahead and play it. Um, can you go back one more time? Yeah, sure. Let's uh, go back 10 seconds. Is that far enough? Um, I just one, I guess 10 more. Sure, let's, let's do 10 more. Can we go back 10 more seconds? <coughs> All right, let's, uh, what was that? Was that 10 seconds? Okay, this is the beginning. Why don't we, can we go all the way back to the beginning of the video? All right, uh, we'll start it from there. Um, I think that, in, so when I, when I was telling, when I told that to police, it was um, basically you can see me running up. They're just to my left in the center of the street, there are some individuals who were uh, yelling. And I guess it's not clear to me, you know, whether they were just advancing in that direction and yelling or advancing specifically towards Mr. Rittenhouse. But um, the individuals that I was referring to when I said that were in the bottom right portion of the screen um, as I was running up. I basically ran past them. Uh, it's clear from the video that Mr. Rosenbaum is specifically target, you know, coming after Mr. Rittenhouse, chasing after him. The impression maybe I misunderstood, it seemed to be that you were indicating you saw other people that were directly going after the defendant. Did you see anything like that, it, other than Mr. Rosenbaum? It seemed to me that they were turning their attention towards him and that uh, they were shouting at him. Um, I wouldn't say that they were like, like I said, it wasn't like a chase. It was like a turning and kind of directing their attention and, and it wasn't you know, a, a running at him more of like turning their bodies towards him and um, like those individuals in the, in the bottom right of the screen um, seemed to be gravitating towards where he was. Um, but they were already headed in that direction anyway. Yeah, that's, uh, that's unclear to me where they were. I, I, like I said, I, I ran up and it was dark, so um, I, like, and I was on the phone. So I just heard the yelling and I saw attention. Um, you know, I, my eyes went to Mr. Rittenhouse because of where other people were looking. Would you agree with me that in the video we're watching, this infrared video, this aerial footage, there aren't any other figures 
that are moving towards the defendant at any point other than Mr. Rosenbaum? Um, if you rewind, I believe that the, um, I mean, it's possible that they're just walking in that direction. So it's not. Um, let's, let's, let's go back to the beginning of the video. And again, if you can use uh, Sister Marciana's pointer and uh, point out anyone that you believe is moving towards the defendant other than Mr. Rosenbaum. Okay, let's, let's, uh, can you bring, come back to the microphone, please? That, uh, yeah, where, the one that we use for the jurors? Okay. Can you help? Yeah. That might help. Why don't you bring that along with you when you go to the screen? And let's back up the video to the beginning again. And then uh, you can feel free to, to speak to that microphone and, and uh, tell us what you're, what you're seeing. Um, hello? Yeah. Um, so when I said that, I was referring to this group right here in the street. Um, and they, they were shouting. Okay. And my, question, my last question to you, Mr. McGinnis, was uh, would you agree with me that on this video, none of those figures actually physically move towards the defendant? Would you agree with me on that? Um, they're moving in the direction of the defendant, but like I said, it's not clear whether they were already moving in that direction prior to my arrival. Um, they, yeah, and like I said, that it was their, their attention and their uh, screaming was directed in his direction, so I, uh, that's where my eyes went. The defendant actually, and, and you, both run up behind these people. Uh, you, you approach them from behind as they're walking forward. Correct. To your knowledge, uh, did any of those folks look back at you as you were approaching from behind? Um, to, to me specifically? Yeah. Um, not that I can recall, no. And in that lot, that car source lot at this particular moment, there are some folks in the lot, certainly on the, uh, on the far corner of the lot there where some parked cars are parked on the left side of the building. Um, we, we all know now, with the benefit of hindsight, there's a large crowd there who are bashing the crap out of those cars. Windows, the, the doors, everything. Um, we know that with hindsight. Let me ask you this. When you were there that night, as this all is unfolding, again, try and put yourself back in that night without the benefit of hindsight, were you aware that there was a group of folks over there that were smashing out car windows or doing anything along those lines? Um, when I was on the phone with Shelby, she mentioned that something was going on up the street, but um, uh, she said like she heard, I believe she said something along the lines of like, there's, like, like windows are breaking. Um, and I assume that that was probably from the windows, the car windows being smashed. Um, but other than that, uh, no. All right. You indicated that the defendant, when he was running away from Mr. Rosenbaum, I think the words you used was he entered a bit of a dead end as he was running uh, by those cars and the building. Um, do you remember saying that? Um, yes, I do. Okay. Um, now, on the video here, um, the person of interest number two with the square around him is the defendant. And uh, person of interest number one with a circle around him is Mr. Rosenbaum. Can we please continue the video forward? Pause it right there, please. Where did our video go? <coughs> oh, okay. I just want to be really clear on this, Mr. McGinnis. Other than Mr. Rosenbaum, did you see anyone else chasing the defendant? Um, the word chase, uh, I wouldn't use that word to describe anybody else's actions. Uh, did you see anyone pursuing him physically in any way other than Mr. Rosenbaum? Um, like I said, the, it's not clear to me whether those other individuals were, you know, already heading in that direction. Um, as for, like, once Mr. Rittenhouse started to uh, run, I didn't see anybody else uh, running after him. So Mr. Rosenbaum is running after the defendant. 
Other than that, no one else is coordinating with Mr. Rosenbaum or helping to, to corral the defendant or, you know, pen him in or anything along those lines that you saw. Would you agree with me on that? Beyond the, um, the screaming and the yelling and, um, you know, maybe walking in his direction, uh, no. Um, the video here uh, shows the defendant, person of interest number two, and he is about to run. Let, let's continue the video to the end, please. Okay, let's stop for a second. Uh, can we go back about 10 seconds? Um, a little bit more. Can, can you keep going back, please? Oh, I'm sorry, that's all the way to the beginning. <laughs> um, let's play it forward. I'll, I'll tell you where to pause. Pause. This uh, video indicates the person of interest number two, the defendant, uh, running. Uh, would you agree with me? He's going to wind up running into the center of those four parked cars to, uh, towards the top, two towards the bottom, and that's where the shooting occurs? Correct. Okay. Now, it appears to me on this video that if you run through those, there's a huge amount of open space on the left bottom of that parking lot, right? Correct. Okay. Yep. Um, I mean, like I said earlier, it, it, uh, that's why I said a bit of a dead end because if somebody wanted to pass through that area, it wasn't like the cars were snugged up and next to each other and you'd have to like jump over them to get out. Like they were, um, you know, parked closely, but there was, there was, you know, enough space to pass through if you wanted to. Now, the area where this all occurs, would you agree with me, is a very well-lit area? Um, yes. Uh, you, you mean this all, you mean the, the final chase? In the parking lot there where the shooting occurs? Yes. There are three large lights up on top of the car source building that are blasting that parking lot with light. Would you agree with me on it's that? Certainly a well-lit, yes, it was a lit parking lot. Um, like I said, the, the street just off there, it was very dark. But that area, um, there, yeah, there were large overhead lights. You have uh, described your uh, impressions of what Mr. Rosenbaum was meaning to do or intending to do in his final physical acts towards the defendant. Would you agree with me that, that you've given us your, your impressions of that? Yes. At any point, did you hear Mr. Rosenbaum say anything about the defendant's gun? I did not know. He never said, I want your gun, I'm going to take your gun, give me your gun, I'm going to steal your gun, anything along those lines. I didn't hear anything like that, no. And you've already established that after the shooting, Mr. Rosenbaum never says a word, correct? Correct. You don't know, as you sit here today, what Mr. Rosenbaum was thinking, do you? You mean at the time of the shooting? Yes. Or at any point in his life. I mean, you have no idea what Mr. Rosenbaum was ever thinking at any point in his life. You have never been inside his head. You never met him before. You don't know. I've, I've never even, I've never exchanged words with him, if that's what your question is. So your interpretation of what he was trying to do or what he was intending to do or anything along those lines is complete guesswork, isn't it? Um, well, he said, fuck you, and then he reached for the weapon. Okay. Let's talk about that. At that very moment, you've testified, the defendant has turned around facing Mr. Rosenbaum, correct? Correct. The defendant has the gun in his hand. Correct. Mr. Rosenbaum is advancing and is pretty close. Yes. Correct? You believe, you've testified, that Mr. Rosenbaum is reaching for the barrel of the defendant's gun. Is that right? Yes. There are many possible reasons why an individual in that position would be reaching for a gun that's pointed in their direction. Would you agree with me on that? 
Um, um, well, to clarify, the the weapon was it was a at a forty five degree angle approximately. Um, I don't can't um, I don't know what you're asking. If you're asking if there's a reason why he would grab it, you've already given us what you think is the reason. I'm suggesting there are other. What, very I never. When, when did I say that I gave a reason? I just said that what he was trying to do. I didn't okay. give any reason on why he would. I have no clue. I, I will say that uh, as many times as you want me to, but I have no clue why he was um, doing what he did. But I saw him go for the front portion of the weapon, and it was um, clear to me that he was. That's what he was trying to do. When you say the front portion, you're you're talking about the fire, the, the end of the barrel where the bullet comes out. It'd actually be more like the shroud. Um, um, so the what? Well, it'd be it'd be the it'd be. Uh, you know, it wasn't like he was grabbing for the very, very tip of the gun. It was like he was grabbing for the front portion of it. So, like, his hand, where he missed, was like, um, you know, I guess six inches up the weapon. Still on the barrel? Um, yeah. So, it's, it, yeah, sure. You indicated that the defendant, or I'm sorry, that Mr. Rosenbaum, I think you used the terms, he was in a low position running. Do you remember saying something to that effect? Mm, yes. Do you have any idea how tall Mr. Rosenbaum was? He's not very tall. Shorter than the defendant? Correct. Shorter than you? Correct. And you said that when the defendant, I'm sorry, when Mr. Rosenbaum was reaching for the defendant's gun, the defendant, you, you've given us a physical gesture and if I'm doing it correctly, and again, um, I'm going to ask you if I'm doing it correctly, it, it's like he's got the gun in his hands. Uh, the barrel is pointed to the defendant's left. He sort of moves it around almost up and over the outstretched hands of Mr. Rosenbaum. Would that be fair to say? So the, you say to the left? To the, the defendant's, the defendant's left? left? Yes. It, it was aimed um, at a 45 degree angle towards the ground. Um, I wouldn't say it was aimed to the left. It was aimed kind of, um, you know, if you were to draw a line, it was aimed um, towards Mr. Rosenbaum, but at the ground. Okay. Um, and then it was when he lunged that the weapon went to his left. And again, with the pronouns, I just want to clarify. When Mr. Rosenbaum lunged, I'm, I'm using yes, the proper yes. names. When Ms. The Rosenbaum, Mr. Rosenbaum lunged, the, Mr. Rittenhouse Move the gun. Move the gun to Mr. Rittenhouse's left, okay. and to my right. And by doing so, uh, I know you've testified you're not sure whether or not Mr. Rosenbaum actually touched the gun. Fair enough? Correct, yes. But at any rate, by doing so, Mr. Rittenhouse was finally able to get that gun in a position where there wasn't any more risk of Mr. Rosenbaum grabbing it by doing that little maneuver, correct? Um, at, so at the point at which um, he dodged around, it was like they were, it was, they were extremely close. And so um, it's not clear to me what would have happened if those shots hadn't have been fired. Final question. You talked at the end of your testimony about um, your feelings as you were accompanying the defendant and Ryan Balch. And you talked about still feeling a sense of, of your safety being in jeopardy. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me your primary concern was the guns. That's what the thing that was making you feel the most unsafe that night, was the presence of these guns. Would that be accurate? Um, well, prior in the evening uh, and, and in the night prior, there were like some people who tried to take my phone from me, um, and then there were the other individuals with the bricks. Um, so uh, I would say that you know it's a baseline level of fear associated with all of those things. Um, but the guns, uh, the, the presence of the weapons, certainly elevated my understanding of the risk of the situation. Thank you. Uh, you may step down, sir. Uh, let's take a break, folks, and uh, I'm going to ask that you return at uh, 10 after.
Please don't talk about the case during the break. Read and watch your lesson on the account of the trial.
to come down, please? Yes. Did you print out your calendar for Monday? I did not. Okay, And <laughs> we warned him. Yeah, we did. Right. My short one. We, uh, we're missing somebody. Yeah, but we're still. We've only. We have 12, 16, 18. No, we got everybody. I don't know. We have 19. Oh, we've only got 18 here. Yeah, I thought there was an empty chair. Okay, there we go. All right. Uh, you may proceed, Mr. Binger. Thank you, Judge. The state calls Ryan Balch. Make sure you pull that microphone close to your mouth and uh, state your name and spell your last name for the record. Uh, Ryan Balch, B-A-L-C-H. <coughs> Where do you live currently? What, what uh, city or town? Jackson, Wisconsin. Back in August of 2020, where, was that where you lived at that time as well? That is correct. And how are you currently employed? I am employed during manufacturing work. Now, was there a time in your past where you uh, served in the United States military? That is correct. Can you tell us about that, please? Uh, from 2008 to 2013, served in the United States Army as an infantryman. Uh, one tour to Iraq, one tour to Afghanistan. And I want to turn your attention to the night of August 25th, 2020. Did you come down to Kenosha that evening? I did. Why? Uh, we had been watching it on the news. Um, some of the people I knew within the protest group had said that things were rough down there. Um, somebody made mention of a Facebook post. I didn't really pay attention to that one too much. Um, but in general, we just decided to come down and help out. When you say we, who are you referring to? Um, the four people that accompanied me. What are their names? Uh, Jason Lakowski. Dustin Colette, and there was a female, I didn't know her name. Prior to that particular night, did you know Dustin Colette and Jason Lakowski? I had known Jason for about four to five years, knew Dustin about three weeks. Where, <coughs> you lived in Jackson at the time, where did those other individuals live? Jason lived in Brown Deer, and Colette lived in West Bend. Now, you indicated that you'd heard from some protesters that things were rough in Kenosha? Correct. When did you hear that? Um, during the first night of the protests and the riots. Just so we're clear about when you say the first night. Um, August 24th. Okay. Would have been. The 
situation kind of began with the shooting of Jacob Blake on Sunday night, August 23rd. Correct. Uh, there were incidents that night, Monday night, August 24th. Uh, there were incidents that night, and of course, Tuesday night, August 25th is the night that we're going to be talking about. Do you remember which of the first two nights it was that you first heard about things? Was it Sunday or Monday? Um, anybody I had contact with wasn't down there for the 23rd, so everything I heard about was on the 24th. Were you personally down here on the 23rd or 24th? No. The first time you came down was on Tuesday? Yes. And uh, when you traveled down here, you mentioned there were three other folks with you, a female and then Mr. Lakowski and Mr. Collette. Um, who all traveled together? Um, I'll have to backtrack a little bit. Um, me and Collette rode together, and the female rode with, I forget the other guy's name that she rode with. Jason Lakowski? No, Jason Lakowski came in later in the evening. I see. Okay. Um, you have identified um, Dustin Collette and Jason Lakowski as people you already knew. Yes. Um, there's a female you've mentioned. Was there anyone else coming down that you knew before this night? Um, Danton Mertz would be somebody that I knew as well. And that's Danton Mertz? Yes. Okay. Um, how long had you known him? About the same amount of time I'd known Colette. Just about three weeks? Yeah. Okay. Do you know where he was from? West Bend. We'll talk in a minute about where you wound up coming to in Kenosha, but when you were thinking about coming down, when you were driving on down to Kenosha, what was your plan? Where were you going to go? Um, we really didn't have a set destination. There had been several places that it, we'd been told might need some help. Um, but when we came in, most of those places were already occupied, so we ended up on Sheridan Road at 63rd and Sheridan. Do you remember any of those other locations that you'd heard about? Uh, they were car lots. I don't remember specifically the names. Okay. Obviously, now you're familiar with Car Source. Correct. Um, prior to uh, coming down to Kenosha, had you ever heard of Car Source before? I didn't know it existed. Obviously, had never shopped or worked there before. No. Okay. When was it that you first learned anything about car source? Um, when we arrived. And when you say when you arrived, <coughs> where exactly did you arrive at? Um, the car source location on 63rd and Sheridan. Okay. There is a little pen in front of you, uh, right in front of you, sir. Yep. Um, and there's a, if you put the, push the button near the end, there's a laser pointer. Can you, on that map behind you, can you identify that location for us? Right. Okay. And that's the car source at the northwest corner of 63rd and Sheridan, correct? That is correct. Okay. Now, you indicated you arrived there. You've identified some other folks that were coming down with you. Did they all come to that location too? Um, everyone but Jason Lakowski. And you mentioned he arrived later. Right. Okay. So in this initial group, you've identified Dustin Collette, Danton Mertz, an unknown female, and yourself. Is that right? That is correct. And all of you wound up starting at that car source. That is correct. Tell us what happened when you arrived there. When we arrived, we encountered, there were five individuals on the car lot at the time. Uh, one guy was working for the hospital, and he was in full military issue gear. And uh, there was Kyle and his friends there as well. Um, we, I talked to the guy who worked for the hospital for a few minutes. Then we went over and talked to Kyle and his friends. And when you say Kyle, you mean the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse? That is correct. Do you remember the names of his friends? Um, I remember Nathan and Dominic. And what happened then? Um, we ta asked them what their plan was, what they were doing. Um, they kind of explained that they worked for the car source facility. Um, and then they described that there were three other locations. And then at that point, the owner to car source showed up. Did you speak with that person? I did not. Do you know that person's name? I have no idea. What did you do next? Um, we kind of, at, at that point, uh, several vans pulled up full of people. Um, they got out. Most of them, there was one guy who was armed similar to the way we were. Uh, the rest were armed with bats, and one of them had like an axe. So melee type stuff. They were there to brawl. Um, they came over to talk to us. The guy and Kit came and talked to me. Um, they agreed to stay at the location in 63rd and Sheridan. 
and we were going to go to 59th and Sheridan. I want to ask a couple of clarification questions. First of all, you said um, some of the folks were, I think you said, dressed like you or equipped like you. I'm not sure how you phrased it, but tell, can you tell us what you mean by that? Um, the one guy that I spoke to was wearing a plate carrier carrying an AR-15. Okay, sorry, wearing what? Carrying a what? Oh, I'm sorry. A uh, plate carrier, body armor, and carrying an AR-15. Did you have body armor on? I did. And you were carrying an AR-15? This is correct. This other person you talked to, were they ex-military like you, do you remember? Um, they said that they had worked for Blackwater. And, and that's a private security contractor? A private security contractor. Okay. Okay. Um, you mentioned, uh, the. Uh, you said vans, I think, more than one? Correct. There were two vehicles, at least, that showed up. Do you know where those folks came from? I didn't question them. Had you ever seen or met any of those folks before? No. Other than the people you've described coming down with, Dustin Collette, Danton Mertz, the unknown female, and, and later on, Jason Lukowski. Right. Other than those folks, the people you encountered on this particular evening, either at this location or elsewhere, had you met any of them before? No. Obviously, never met the defendant before? No. Had no idea who he was before that night? Nope. You mentioned that one of the folks that came in the vans was similarly equipped as you, and then the rest had different types of, I think you characterized them as melee weapons. Would that be fair to say? That would be fair to say. Meaning not guns such as handguns or shotguns or AR-15s? Correct. And <coughs> I believe you said that at that point, at some point, there was an understanding that those folks that came in the vans would stay at 63rd Street Car Source, and some of, some of you, including yourself, would go up to the 59th Street Car Source. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. What time of day was this when you were having this encounter at the 63rd Street Car Source? It was source? approximately 7.30 p.m. You were aware that the city of Kenosha had a curfew that night at 8 p.m., correct? Correct. You intended to stay past the curfew time. Is that fair to say? That is correct. I know you mentioned earlier something about hearing about the prior night's events, uh, things like that. Um, and I, maybe I asked this, and you may have given me a little bit of an answer, but what were what were you actually intending to do physically? Like, what, was, what were you actually going to do when you got here to Kenosha? Um, the intent when we got down there was to... stop the people from looting and rioting and whatnot. Um, most of the protesters that I talked to before coming down there were trying to control them throughout the night, and it just wasn't working. So... We were there to be more of a deterrence than anything. What were you going to do yourself, personally, to accomplish that goal? Uh, pretty much tell people to stop. Just be, I mean, throughout the night it kind of proved out that we didn't have to actually do anything to not have them do it. Just us being there seemed to work. And that was kind of my intent the whole time, was to just be there, be seen, and to deter people from doing that. You mentioned your AR-15 and your body armor that you were wearing. Beyond that, what sort of equipment did you bring along to assist you? Maybe not stuff you actually used, but things you brought along in preparation for this night. Um, Dustin Colette had brought some pepper spray grenades with him, and he kind of handed those out. You, we've seen photographs of you and videos of you, which we'll get to in a little bit. It appears that you've got maybe a utility belt on or something like that. I don't know. Uh, can you tell us in your own words what other things you had on your body in terms of equipment? I had extra ammunition and extra medical equipment. Any other types of weapons or self-defense equipment on you? Um, I had a Glock 17 handgun 
ammunition for that. But as far as a less than lethal option, no. Okay. You talked about your desire to serve as a deterrent to people. Um, what was it about you or your actions that you thought would work as a deterrent? Um, typically the people that were, and from what I've been told by the protesters and stuff, they were selecting places that were unguarded, that there was nobody there, that they could just go in and do what they need, light it on fire, take whatever they wanted, and roll out after that. So I figured just being there would be enough. If just being there was enough, why did you bring along an AR-15, a handgun, and wear body armor? Well, because those people could be armed, too. Um, if I'm going to get shot, I'd rather have body armor on, first and foremost. Um, and I would like to be able to defend myself from it as well. So is it fair to say that coming down to Kenosha that night, you were prepared for the possibility that there would be gunfire? That's correct. You were prepared to use your gun to defend yourself? That is correct. Were you planning on using the gun to protect the property that you were guarding? No. So for example, we know that you were at the 59th Street car source uh, for that a lot correct. of the evening. If you had seen someone attempting to damage a vehicle, uh, would you have used your gun and fired at that person to protect that property? No. At any point that evening, and I know I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but I'm trying to get to a point here. Uh, did you go inside the 59th Street car source? A couple of times, yes. What was inside there? Uh, several cars that were being worked on, some tables, some chairs. Was there a, a, a living quarters or an apartment or anything like that where someone was able to sleep or live? Not that I saw, but I did see that it was attached to a gas station. Do you know if the gas station was uh, open and, and in business at that time? Um, when we walked by, it appeared to be in business. But it's fair to say that no one was living here. This was all business property. Fair that to is say. fair to say. As opposed to a house or an apartment. That is fair to say. If there had been any sort of damage to the building, the car source building, such as being lit on fire or rocks thrown at it or anything like that, would that have caused an injury or a death to a, to a person? Had the fire spread to the residential buildings behind it, yes. Okay. At any point in this evening, did anyone try and start a fire at that car source location? Um, later on in the evening, they tried to start a dumpster on fire, and before that, they tried to light the church next door on fire. And that's the church that's to the north across 59th Street? Correct. Okay. The dumpster that was attempted to be started on fire was actually located in the street when that event occurred. Is that Correct. right? They pulled it off the parking lot area of car source and lit it on fire in the street. So rather than try and light the fire where the dumpster is in the car source lot, they took it out in the road and then lit it on fire? Correct. And I believe that's where, at some point that evening, Dustin Collette goes out and puts the fire out. That is correct. Okay. I skipped around a little bit there. I want to go back to where we were. Um, I believe you were describing how there was uh, vans that met at 63rd. There was some sort of understanding that they would stay there, and you and others would go up to the 59th Street car source. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. What did you do after that? Um, I went across the street to the hospital where the other guy had gone. Um, I met their guy they had watching the gate, and I didn't wholly trust the people who had agreed to stay down at 63rd, so I gave him my cell phone number and said, hey, if these guys leave or somebody starts breaking stuff, call us. Did you ever get a call that night? Um, no. What did you do after that? Um, we kind of gathered up. I think we took a picture. And then we went up to 59th. When you say we went up to 59th, who all came along with you? That would have been Dustin, the female, Danton Mertz, Kyle Rittenhouse, Dominic, 
and Nathan. Other than the folks you just mentioned, did anyone else come along that you can recall? Not that I can recall. Is it fair to say that when you first got to the 59th Street location, the people you just mentioned was the group that was there protecting that property? Yes. I know Jason Lukowski comes later. Other than him, was anyone else there that night at 59th Street that may have arrived later to help with what you were doing? Um, some family members for, from Kyle's friends showed up. Do you remember who they were? Uh, one of them was one of their fathers. Um, there was somebody else that came through. They were there for five, ten minutes, and they left. I didn't know who that was. Do you remember uh, approximately what time it was when you got up to the 59th Street car source location? Um, we crossed 60th right as the sirens went off at 8, 8, 8 p.m. So we arrived at 59th around 8.01, 8.02. Where did you position yourself at that point? Um, I stayed on the ground outside in the car lot area. Most of the cars were burned out at that point. And some of the guys went up on the roof, and some of us stayed down on the ground level. Now, you mentioned earlier you met uh, the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse, that evening. Correct. And that was first at the 63rd Street car source, right? Yes. And then he came along up to the 59th Street car source. Yes. Did he ever tell you how old he was? Um, we asked the group when we first got there. They looked kind of young, and the general consensus was 19. Not sure what you mean by general consensus. Is that something the defendant actually said? Um, it seemed like as a group they were saying it, and I didn't ask. I was just kind of off to the side when that conversation happened. After uh, everything happened on August 25th, uh, you met with an FBI agent by the name of Tim Walther um, at your residence up in Jackson. Do you remember that? I do. And do you remember him uh, talking to you about this particular night? Yes. And do you remember telling him, and I'm going to quote from your statement here, Rittenhouse told Balch that he was 19. However, Balch thought he was younger. Do you remember saying that to the agent? I do. Did the defendant say anything else to you about himself or his qualifications or anything like that? Early on in the night, no. Is it fair to say that as the night went on, uh, while you were on the ground in front of the 59th Street car source, the defendant was also in that proximity uh, area? That is correct. Were there times during the evening when you would chat with him about various things? That is correct. What was your impression of the defendant? Um, he seemed like a young and impressionable kid. Um, I use that term kind of broadly there, someone way younger than myself. Um, he seemed to be really interested in what I had done in life. Um, when Jason Lakowski showed up, he seemed to be interested in what he had done in life. Um, he had explained some of the stuff he had been doing, uh, the lifeguard, being a lifeguard, being EMT certified, stuff like that. So the defendant told you that he was a certified EMT? This is correct. And that he was 19 years old? This is correct. Okay. Um, What did you think about the defendant being there that night? He had as much right as anybody else to be there. Did it seem like he was um, properly equipped or prepared uh, to be out there doing what he was doing that night? He seemed a little under-equipped and under-experienced as well, which is one of the reasons we kind of stayed with him. When you say we stayed with him, who do you mean? Uh, Danton Murch, Dustin Colette, and the female. Did you feel like um, you needed to keep an eye on the defendant? She seemed like it, yes and no. Um, I felt like as young as he looked and what the way he was, the, just the general way he was carrying himself, the protesters would have seen that as a weakness and tried to exploit that. Is it fair to say that you took it upon yourself that evening to um, stay close to the defendant, 
to ensure there were no problems? Um, we pretty much all picked one of the guys that we met at 63rd and kind of looked out for him, yes. And you personally picked the defendant? Uh, it's kind of more of a he picked me kind of thing. <laughs> at any rate, uh, it turned out that uh, you spent a lot of the evening close by the defendant. Fair enough? That is fair. Okay. One of the things that the defendant was uh, asking you about was your military experience. Is that right? This is correct. What did you tell him about that? Uh, I just told him about the various deployments and what I'd done while I was there. Now, you mentioned earlier that the when you arrived at the 59th car so Street car source, it was a little after 8 o'clock, a little after curfew. Can you describe for us what the scene was at that location at that time? Um, most of the cars in the parking area had been burned out. Um, the building itself had been boarded up pretty good. You could see some evidence on the side of the building where people had thrown things at it to try to start it on fire. But other than that, it, you know, typical like a war zone, what I would say. What about the street uh, in front, Sheridan Road, in that area? Were there a lot of people around at that point? Um, at the time, it was mostly law enforcement and people similar to us milling around. Um, we had an occasional group of protesters coming through. Now, there are, uh, on that particular evening, there are protests that were going on in Kenosha. Were you aware of that at the time? Yes, we could see them up by the courthouse from that position. Is it fair to say that when you first got to Car Source, most of the protesters and most of the protest was north of your location? That is correct. Closer to Civic Center Park, which is right out in front of the courthouse? That is correct. Okay. Did there come a time in which the crowd started to come down closer to the 59th Street Car Source? Before the police started to push them towards us, there were some folks that came through. Um, most of them were carrying fire extinguishers and said they were putting out fires and whatnot. You mentioned the police pushing them to you. Did there come a time when that happened? Yes. I've seen statements at various times where you have uh, talked about uh, hearing the police say something about what the plan was or what they were intending to do. Um, did you ever talk to any law enforcement officer that yes. night? And did they tell you something about what the plan was? Yeah, right before, I want to say around 9 p.m., uh, me and Kyle were walking down to the ultimate gas station, and we encountered a female deputy. And she told us, hey, we're getting ready to start pushing them down, you guys. Once that happens, it's, it's kind of going to be on you guys. And she got in her patrol car and left. Who was that person? I didn't get a name. Um, so your understanding was that the police were going to move the, all these protesters into your area and give you the job of taking care of them? She didn't insinuate that so much as it seemed like what was likely going to happen. Do you know what the rank of this person was that you spoke to? Was this a captain, a lieutenant, a sergeant, anything like that? I didn't see any rank. Other than that, did you speak with any other law enforcement officers about this notion? No. Okay. And you said the defendant witnessed that? That is correct. And I believe you mentioned that was around 9 o'clock? It would have been around 9 o'clock. Had the uh, police already pushed the protesters down your way at that point or, or did that come later? That, would, that came a little bit later. They started pushing them around 9, 30, 10. Okay. So I want to talk about the time period from when you first got to 59th at around 8 or so and that time at 9, 30 or 10 when the protesters start getting pushed down your way. Sure. So there's an hour and a half, maybe two hour period of time. Okay. During that time period, where were you located? Uh, for the most part, 59th. Was um, the defendant also there? That is correct. What were you doing? Oh, we were just kind of standing around talking. A couple of times, some of the protesters came over and told us that, hey, some people are trying to set this building on fire, so we'd go over there, and when we'd show up, they'd run away. 
Um, that's around the time that they tried to, we were told they were trying to light the church on fire. And at that point, we were told it was a bald guy with a red shirt. So let me stop you for a second. You indicated that there were times in which you received reports that someone was trying to start something on fire, and you said we would go over there. Who's we? Um, it was a mix each time. Did, uh, did the defendant ever go? He went with us at least once when we went over to the Stella when they were trying to break the windows out over there. Okay. So t tell me what you remember about that. Um, so the same protesters that were carrying fire extinguishers before, they were from Kenosha. They had stopped and talked with us quite a bit. Um, in fact, we'd helped them carry one of somebody from up at the protest back beyond the police so they could take them to the hospital. And the defendant helped with that as well. Um, they came running down because there were, in their words, there were people trying to break into the Stella and light it on fire. Um, somebody had pointed a gun at them, and the cops weren't around. So we headed across the other car source facility, across the way into the burned out cars, and <clears throat> there were three to four subjects breaking out windows on the Stella and just milling around over there. And once we got to within 100 yards of them, um, I believe it was Colette yelled out at them, they turned and saw us and they ran off. You were one of the people along with Dustin Colette that went over there? That's correct. Who else went with you? I wanna say that Kyle was with us and one of the protesters who had <laughs> told us about it so I, I understand no one wants windows broken out or fire right. started or anything like this but what what gave you the right to go around and police that area um, well there were members of the community that asked us to go help them who who the, these four protesters well, those you characterized as folks walking with fire extinguishers. Were this they from the Stella? They came from that direction. Were they employed by the Stella? I didn't ask. You, is it fair to say you heard a report that somebody was up to no good and you decided to head over there and stop it? Correct. Other than that, you don't know anything more about what was going on? No. And these people you saw milling about at the Stella, do you know who they were? Um, one was a tall, one of them was fairly tall. The rest of the people seemed to be about average height or shorter. Beyond that description of their height, do you know anything else about them? No, we didn't get that close. Don't know where they came from? Nope. Don't know their names? Nope. Don't know where they went afterwards? Nope. Don't know what their affiliation, if any, was with the Stella? Right? I would assume they weren't affiliated with the Stella. I would assume somebody breaking the Stella's windows is probably not. Okay. I agree with that. But my point is, is you're making an assumption. Correct. With less than perfect information. That is correct. You mentioned a fire uh, at the St. James. Was that at the St. James Church? Um. This church right here. Now. Can you just uh, put your pointer back up right where you were doing? This is a satellite photograph of Kenosha that's a little older. There's a building that you're pointing at right now. On the night of August 25th, 2020, that building wasn't standing anymore, was it? No. There was a pile there of rubble? There was rubble right here, but there's another building right in there. Okay. Uh, the church itself is actually on the other end of the, the north end of the block uh, along 58th Street. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. When you said you mentioned something about a fire or somebody's trying to start a fire at that location. Can you tell us more about that? Um, yes, the same individuals that told us about the Stella showed up again and they described a female, two males trying to light a fire at the church. What did you do? Um, we kind of just walked around the street to kind of look around there when we got there. We could see somebody on the front of the church. They saw us. They ran off. Did you see anything more than that one person? Uh, no. Did you see what that person was doing? No. 
Did you see a fire? No. Did you put out a fire? No. We've talked about, and, and again, I, I started this with asking you about that 8 o'clock to 9.30 or 10 o'clock period of time, and you've described a couple of things, the Stella incident, the St. James incident. So beyond that, what other things were you doing in that period of time? Um, we were walking down to 63rd to check it out. At that point, we had figured out that the folks that said they were going to stay there no longer stayed there. So onesies and twos. Two at a time, people were going down there to check on it. Then they would go over to the ultimate, check on the guys over there, see what they were doing, and then circle back and come back. We've seen some photos and videos of the ultimate gas station. Would it be fair to say that there were people protecting that location that were similar to your group, you know, armed with long rifles, things like that? That is correct. And you mentioned that. The, whatever these vans were with these folks with melee weapons at 63rd, at some point in the evening you found out they weren't there anymore? That is correct. I want to ask more specifically about that. Was that something that you personally found out or you heard from someone else? Um, I kind of just heard it through discussion that there was nobody down there anymore. When you heard that, how many people were in your group guarding the 59th Street location at that point? It would have been around seven or eight. And you said you would send groups of two people at a time to go down to 63rd? That's correct. Were you ever one of those folks? Yes. Was the defendant? Yes. What was going on when you went down there? Um, when we went down that way, there was nobody down there. Um, a couple of the folks that had been down there initially had moved over to the Ultimate. That seemed to be where they had kind of ganged up, but the folks with the melee stuff had kind of gone. Okay, so I want to make sure I'm understanding you. You said a couple of the folks that were at the 63rd Street car source initially wound up going over to the Ultimate gas station? That is correct. Were those folks that came in those vans? Um, one of them came at the same time the vans did. Okay. So the, one, uh, one of the people that came at the same time as the vans did wound up at Ultimate Gas. That is correct. And it sounds like there may have been more more than just one person from 63rd that wound up at Ultimate Gas? There was one other guy that was with him when we showed up. Okay. So is it fair to say that, speaking for you personally, Mr. Balch, you felt like it was part of your responsibility to not only guard the 59th Street car source, but also the 63rd Street car source. That is correct. Which is why you were and other folks were going down there to check on it. That's correct. Okay. So I want to continue talking about that 8 o'clock to 9.30 or 10 o'clock period. We've <coughs> talked about a few things. Other than that, what else was, were you doing during that period of time? Um, mostly we were just kind of talking to people when they would walk by. Um, we didn't really have any negative encounters during that period of time. Um, you to get the occasional person wanting to have a debate and whatnot, but most of it was just walking down to 63rd, somebody coming saying somebody's trying to light something on fire, go check it out, come back, wash, rent, repeat. Okay. So now uh, you've mentioned there was a time when the police started to move the protesters in your direction, and I think you said earlier that was around 9.30 or 10 o'clock? This is correct. Okay. Tell us about that. Um, as soon as they started pushing the protesters, we started getting the less, I guess the people who weren't intending on participating in a riot, I should say, started kind of drifting down towards us. Um, there were some, they were <laughs> shouting insults at us, um, and some of the other members of the group were having back and forth with them. Um, I spent the large majority of that time trying to calm people down and just keep them moving down the street. Uh, then we started encountering people who were more and more aggressive, and the cops would push them, then they would back off, then they'd come back and push them again, and they would push them further south each time, or, yeah, that's south. When you describe these interactions with the people walking past, um, was the defendant present for any of that? He had one exchange that I saw. 
Who was that with? Just some random person in the crowd screamed, fuck you. At the defendant? Yes. How did the defendant react to that? He said, I love you too, ma'am. Um, you mentioned earlier that there was some sort of report of someone in a red shirt with bald head who was reported to be involved in some sort of incident. I think I heard you mention that. As yes. Well. We now know with the benefit of hindsight who Joseph Rosenbaum was, and we've seen photographs of him in a red shirt and a bald head. Um, let me start by asking, whatever report you heard uh, regarding Mr. Rosenbaum at that particular time, you did you ever see him at that time? Um, I had seen someone fitting the description, kind of milling in and out of the groups that were coming through. Um, every time he was around the groups, when now that I know who Joseph Rosenbaum was and can confirm who he was and stuff, um, he was not organic with the protesters. What do you mean by that? They didn't seem comfortable with his presence or the people that were with him. Who was with him? Uh, he had a male and a female that were with him pretty much consistently throughout the night. So you saw those folks together? Yes. Him and the male and the female? Did you ever see them speaking to one another? Um, the male and the female, yes. But as far as them talking to him directly, no. So you never saw Mr. Rosenbaum talk to that male or female? No. And you never saw the male and female talk to Mr. Rosenbaum? No. But you're, you saw them in proximity to one another, so you're making some sort of assumption that they had some sort of association. Is that fair to say? Um, I saw them in close proximity with each other several times which led to that assumption. Okay. Um, tell us about the first time that you observed Mr. Rosenbaum. Um, the first time he was just getting aggravated with someone in the crowd. And the protesters were trying to, like, separate him from whoever that was. And he was shouting, you know, fuck you kind of things to everyone. And they kind of walked off. And one of the things that stood out to me was the tall male that was with him had a handgun in his hand with the finger on the trigger pointed down to the ground. Now, you had an AR-15. This is correct. And you had your hand on the, the um, butt of that AR-15? No. At no point? Hand on the grip with the fingers straight forward along the side of the receiver. I, I misspoke when I said butt. I mean, I, the, the grip, the pistol grip of the AR-15, you had your hand on that with your, your finger not on the trigger but within close proximity. Fair that is say? correct. Okay. And this individual had a handgun right. with his finger on the trigger. This is correct. And that caused you to be concerned of some sort of what? Well, you're typically taught not to put your finger on the trigger unless you're ready to shoot. Um, the way he was holding it, had anybody bumped into him or him tripped and fell, he would have been sent it around off into who knows what. So I just saw it as unsafe. And the potential for some sort of tragic accident. Correct, or he was prepared for something. Did you ever see him point that gun at anyone? Um, no. Did you ever see him fire that gun? No. And obviously you had a gun that was bigger and more powerful than his. Fair to say? This is fair to say. And you're familiar with AR-15s? That's correct. How long had you owned your AR-15? Since 2012. So eight years? Yes. And over that period of time, how many times had you fired your AR-15? By August of 2020, I probably had somewhere close to 10 to 15,000 rounds through it. And what type of ammo? What did it take? What caliber? 5.56. Five, and are you familiar with the term full metal jacket? This is correct. And yes. is that the type of ammo you would use? Yes. And can you, uh, as a military former infantryman in the Army who's fired ten to 15,000 rounds, can you tell us a little bit about what full metal jacket are, um, bullets are? Um, FMJ, full metal jacket bullets are just a solid copper jacket around a lead core. There's nothing really particularly special about it. It's not particularly more dangerous than any other type of ammunition. Um, in the state of Wisconsin, you're not allowed to hunt with full metal jacket ammunition. Do you know why that is? Uh, penetration. Over-penetration. 
What does that mean? Uh, FMJ versus hollow points. Uh, hollow points are designed to hit the target and expand and transfer the energy. A full metal jacket's not designed to do that. So depending on what it hits, it can just sail right on through. So it's fair to say that a full metal jacket round fired from an AR-15 has the potential for hitting whatever it's shot at, say a deer, for example, and going through that and continuing on to something down the line. It can. As opposed to a hollow point, which typically hits a deer, for example, and then stops. Yes. And is it fair to say in your experience that uh, a Glock handgun like you had that night is often loaded with hollow point ammunition and a AR-15 is often loaded with full metal jacket ammunition? Uh, it depends on what you're doing with it. Is that what you they, typically would do? I tend to run full metal jackets, yes. In the, in the AR-15? In the AR-15. What about in your Glock? Hollow points. And why is that? Um, my AR-15, I mostly use it for target and competition shooting. Um, Glock is more for personal defense. Loading a handgun like a Glock with uh, hollow point ammunition is what you would consider to be uh, the better choice for self-defense. Yeah, for concealed carry, absolutely. What about for open carry? For open carry, it would be the same thing for a Glock handgun. When you've fired your AR-15, 10 to 15,000 rounds of full metal jacket ammunition through there, um, what is the furthest distance of target that you've uh, hit with that? 500 yards. So it's a weapon that's capable of shooting a full metal jacket round and hitting a target 500 yards away? Its maximum effective range is 550 yards, this is correct. Now, we were talking about uh, Mr. Rosenbaum and your observations of him, and I think you described something out in the street uh, with some other protesters, or he yelled F you to them, something along those lines. What else did you see him do that night? Every time I encountered Joseph Rosenbaum, he was hyper aggressive and acting out in a violent manner. When we say violent manner, you, you saw him hitting, punching, kicking he people? Was always having to be restrained by someone. Okay. And I, I understand that. Did you ever see him hit anyone? I, the crowd was pretty good about getting in between him and whoever it was. If he landed a blow, I didn't see it, but he definitely wanted to. Well, now, you have no idea, do you, what was going on in Mr. Rosenbaum's head? No. You'd never met him before that night? No. Okay. So let's just keep to your observations if we can. Right. How tall are you? 5'9". How tall was Mr. Rosenbaum? Five four, five three. So, so much shorter and smaller than you. Yes, sir. Um, now I know you want to talk about what you believe he was intending to do, but my question to you was: Did you ever actually see him hit anyone? No. Did you ever actually see him kick anyone? No. Did you ever actually see him with a weapon in his hand? No. Did you ever actually see him cause any physical injury to anyone that night? I saw him attempt to do it on a couple of occasions, but I never saw that, him. That was it. not my question, Mr. Balch. Did you ever? Excuse me? I, I, it was my impression he was answering your question. You, you, you'd agree with me? Cross examination. Pardon me? It's not cross examination. He's supposed to ask open ended questions, he was answering. I, I, it was my impression that the witness had not completed his answer. I apologize. I'll, I'll try to stop uh, uh, jumping in a little too soon, Mr. Balch. Um, did you ever see the defendant actually physically in, or sorry, Mr. Rosenbaum? Did you ever actually see Mr. Rosenbaum physically injure anyone that night? No. Did you personally have any interactions with Mr. Rosenbaum? I got between him and Colette at one point, and then he threatened me and the defendant. The f time you described where you and you got in between him and Dustin Collette, between Mr. Rosenbaum and Dustin Collette, was the defendant present for that? 
Uh, it immediately preceded him threatening me in Cal House. So was the defendant present for that? Yes. Tell us about that. Um, Colette had stopped him from putting something, starting something on fire. There's a video of it. And um, Dustin Colette said something to the effect of fuck around and find out. And I stepped in and told everybody, chill out, calm down, stop doing that. I turned and had an exchange with one of the protesters. And I kind of explained to that protester, hey, you know, I get it, get what you're trying to do, but like not this and when I turned around Rosenbaum was right there in front of my face yelling and screaming and I would say dude back up just chill I don't know what your problem is and he goes you know what if I catch any of you guys alone tonight I'm gonna fucking kill you and he said that to you correct did he say that to the defendant as well the defendant was there so yes and as far as you could tell, the defendant was close enough to hear what Mr. Rosenbaum said. That is correct. Now, when this conversation occurred, were you wearing your AR-15 uh, slung in front of your body? That is correct. Did Mr. Rosenbaum ever reach for it? He didn't try. Did he touch it? No. You had your Glock pistol on your hip, correct? That is correct. Did he ever reach for that? No. Did he ever touch that? No. Did he ever touch you? No. And at that point, could you see that Mr. Rosenbaum had no weapons of any kind? He had a bag full of what looked to be chemicals to me in his hand, the guy with the Glock with a handgun behind him, and a female with a backpack. That was what yeah. I con considered Rosenbaum having with him. Okay. So a couple things. First of all, uh, this bag, this plastic bag. Yes. Was it something that you could see inside? It was a clear hospital type bag. It had containers, but I couldn't really tell what the containers were. I made the assumption at the time and told the FBI the same thing, that I thought it was for making Molotov cocktails. And was that actually true? Um, I saw this, a similar bag later in the night that didn't contain those chemicals. So That's the assumption. Did not? Did not? Did not. When you say you saw a similar bag in the night, what you mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, is after the defendant shot Mr. Rosenbaum, uh, in that incident, Mr. Rosenbaum threw that same, and we can see from the videos, he throws that same bag at the defendant, and it is left lying on the ground of the 63rd Street car source. You're aware of that from all the videos, correct? Yes. Did you go to that 63rd Street car source after the defendant killed Joseph Rosenbaum? Yes. Did you see that plastic bag laying on the ground? Yes. Did you look inside of it? Yes. Did it have any sort of Molotov cocktail? No, it had some, like, bottles that would be for soap, but I'd seen plenty of people carrying those around during the protest, so I had no idea what was actually contained within them. And when you say you see, you've seen a lot of people carrying bottles of soap around? Incognito bottles to carry things around in. When you looked inside the bag that Joseph Rosenbaum was carrying, did you see any chemicals that could be used to start any sort of tear gas or explosion or fire or anything along those lines? I didn't really so much as look into it as I kind of picked it up and just kind of tossed it back on the ground but it didn't appear to be any sort of lighter fluid or anything like that in there. Did you see anything in that bag that uh, you would construe as harmful or dangerous? No. In fact, you felt safe enough to walk up to it, pick it up, and look at it. Fair? That's fair. So getting back to this incident where the defendant, is, or that Mr. Rosenbaum is talking to you and the defendant, you mentioned that there's two people, a uh, male and a female, that are close by. Uh, as we sit here today, do you now know who those folks were? Um, no, I don't. Okay. Did those, that male and female that you're talking about, did they say anything to you? No, the male always just had kind of a, a grin on his face the whole time. Um, like he was kind of enjoying all the 
violence and shenanigans as was going on. Other than that, did he say anything to you? No. Did he say anything to the defendant? I never saw him speak to the defendant. Did you see the female speak to you at any point? No. Did you see her speak to the defendant? No. Did either one of them do anything threatening towards you? No. Did either one do anything threatening towards the defendant? No. You've described a series of events that occurred, uh, and we're trying to, I'm trying to go back to the timing here, because I think you mentioned around 9.30 or 10 o'clock is when the police started pushing protesters by. And I think you said it, there were times when the protesters would come back and then be pushed back, back and forth. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. Would you mind using that pointer, that laser pointer again, um, and point out the, the, the 59th Street car source, please? And just for the benefit of the jury, when you talk about the police moving the protesters uh, out on the street, would you agree with me that they're being the, the police are pushing people south on Sheridan uh, from 58th to 59th and eventually down south to 60th? That is correct. And then you've described times when the police would pull back. Would they pull back north of 59th? Yes. So the protesters would be cleared from your area, but then allowed to come back in front of you and back and forth? Yes. Okay. Um, when those movements would occur, I know you've described a little bit about the interactions with the folks on the street. In general, how would you say the attitude was of the people on the street towards you and your group? Most of them seemed indifferent. When you say most of them, were there others that didn't seem indifferent? There were some that either seemed really angry about us being there, and then there were other people that seemed like they were kind of happy to just stand around and talk to us. Do you remember there being issues with the laser pointers? I do remember them calling out about people on the roof pointing laser pointers at them. And during that exchange with the person, somebody in the crowd actually pulls out a laser pointer and started doing the same thing. And at that point, to me, it was kind of null, because who's pointing the laser pointer? Did you have any sort of laser um, sight on your gun that would illuminate a target? No. Do you know who it was up on the roof who was doing I anything like no that? I had no idea who had that up there. Do you recall speaking with a uh, individual who was uh, taking video for a, um, a news source or a media uh, online source called The Rundown Live? I remember him coming into the car source area, but we didn't. it wasn't so much as a formal interview as he was just standing around talking to us. Do you remember uh, him speaking to you and the defendant uh, when that dumpster fire occurred out in front of your location? Yes. Do you remember him speaking about staying on your property as opposed to going out in the street? Yes. That's something you heard? Yes. What did you think about that? Um, we had protesters coming on to car sores. Um, by this point, we we're already going out and like people were getting knocked down in the street. We were already going out in the street, dragging them out of the street, making sure they were okay. Um, he seemed to be pretty, he seemed to want to keep us out of the street as much as possible. But by that point, there really was no declination between what was car source and what was the street. Well, you knew where the property line was. Yes. Um, but I'm, I understand you wanting to maybe go out and help people and things like that, but did you interpret that message or did you think to yourself we can stay here and protect this property but it's not our job to go out there and police the neighborhood did that, that thought ever occur to you not really no okay so you felt like you were free to go out and confront people that you felt were doing things wrong no help me understand that then um it wasn't so much as a, 
I'm going to go out there and confront people because I can. It was if somebody from the crowd asked us to go help them, we would. Okay. So if, if, you're in, if you're invited. Right. But you're, you weren't going to just rush into a situation when you're uninvited and try and interfere. That's correct. Forgive me if I've already asked this, but I'm, I'm trying to keep the timing straight here. We've talked about your arrival at the 59th Street Car Source at around 8 p.m. When you first got there at that time, was there other folks that were supposed to be stationed at the 63rd Street Car Source? Um, no. So when, when was it that you learned that the group that was supposed to be at 63rd Street Your had... Honor, minutes ago. Uh, this is, uh, uh, how much longer do you expect this particular examination to last? Of this witness in total? Well, uh, or about it, this it, particular it, issue? Well, it's been a lengthy discussion and I'm just wondering where we're getting. If I could just finish this question, I'll jump forward. I'm sorry. I just, I may have missed the answer earlier and I apologize if Go I've ahead. already asked this. Um, do you remember when it was that you first learned that the folks that were supposed to be at 63rd weren't there anymore? What time of the day or evening? It would have been about an hour after we actually got to the 59th Street. So I think you said you first got there at 8, so yes. maybe 9? Nine? 9. Okay. Now, you've mentioned you had an interaction with Mr. Rosenbaum. Yes. Was that at the 59th Street location? Yes. After that, did you have any other interactions with him that night? Um, we encountered him hit and miss throughout the night, but he never like approached us again that I saw and he tried to engage us. But you saw him around? Yes. Okay. Um, what were your impressions of him when you saw him on those other times? No, he was in the middle of them trying to light things on fire, smashing anything he could. Um, in general, he was just being aggressive to the other guys down at the Ultimate. Um, the protesters were getting pretty upset with him being around. Um, they were very quick to let us know throughout the night, hey, that guy's not with us, that guy's not with us, don't be mad at us, and we're like, hey, we get it already dealt with him before and that was just the general vibe from him throughout the night so you mentioned that you saw him starting things on fire when did you see that um a couple more dumpsters um they tried to light a road sign on fire that he was a part of that um just random little things do you know if the defendant saw any of that it's possible the defendant was close by when all this was going on. When you say Mr. Rosenbaum was trying to start some other dumpsters on fire, where was that at? Throughout the street, all up and down 59th. Did he ever take any uh, or was involved in uh, any of the um, dumpsters at Ultimate Gas being started on fire, if you, if you know? I do believe talking to people after the fact that he was, but I couldn't confirm that myself. Okay, and again, I'm not interested in what other people think or even what you've seen. I'm That particular night, and I, I know it's hard to pretend you haven't seen any other videos in the last year, but I'm trying to focus in on what you actually remember that night, what you saw that night. Do you remember seeing Mr. Rosenbaum uh, actually start any of those dumpsters on fire? No. Do you remember actually seeing him start that street sign on fire? Yes. Where was that at? That would have been... The protesters had been pushed a little bit south of us at that point. Oh, where's the button? But there were road closed signs all through here, and they drug one off right about where I'm at. Right in there. And so you're pointing to a location on Sheridan Road just north of 60th? That's correct. And when you say they took a sign, uh, did you see Mr. Rosenbaum do that? Yes. And what happened then? Um, they tried to light it on fire. It wouldn't go, so they kicked it over. When you, you, know, when you say a <coughs> uh, road closed sign, can you describe what that looks like? It was one of those big metal, you know, the ones that are portable that they can put in front of a road to stop it, to close it real quick. 
so about as wide as the witness stand is. And again, you said so they tried to start on a fire, but they couldn't. Yeah. So they just knocked it over. Yeah. Other than that, did you see Mr. Rosenbaum try and start any other fires? Not after that, no. You said, I think you said he was trying to smash things? Yes. What did you see? Uh, he was throwing rocks into the car source area. He was throwing rocks at buildings along the street. Oh, he was having a pretty good time. Did you ever see him throw any sort of um, uh, tear gas or gas container or anything along those lines? I never saw him personally throw anything like that. When you say he was throwing rocks into the car source location, do you mean the 59th Street car source The location? 59th Street and the gas station that's attached. Did you see those rocks hit anyone? No, I didn't see them hit anyone. What action, if any, did you take uh, after seeing the defendant throw rocks at your group? I'm sorry, they're, they're Mr. Rosenbaum. Um, we didn't really take any action. Um, by that point, the protesters were also pretty done with people doing that, so they were policing them as well. Did you feel like Mr. Rosenbaum's act of throwing rocks at your group was a, a danger to your safety? Yes. Did you feel like you needed to defend yourself? At that time, no. Why not? Um, his aim wasn't very good, and he was pretty good far away. He was pretty far away. Sounds like he was trying, but not really succeeding. Yeah. Other than what we've just talked about. Did you have any other sightings, conversations, encounters, or anything along those lines with Mr. Rosenbaum that night? No. Now, you said there was a time in which you, um, where the police had pushed the protesters down uh, south of 60th Street. Is that right? That is correct. And I know you said that there was some back and forth. Did there come a time in which the line of police vehicles kind of finalized and stayed at 60th? Yes. When that happened, were you still at the 59th Street location? That is correct. After the police had pushed all the protesters south of 60th, was there any further risk of danger to the 59th Street car source location? Um, we were unaware of if or when the police were going to pull back again. So we did leave people there. If the police hadn't pulled back, if they'd stayed at that 60th Street line and kept the protesters south of 60th, would there have been any further risk of danger to the 59th Street location? Yeah, this is speculation. Sustain. After the police pushed the protesters south of 60th, was there any damage done at all after that to the 59th Street location? Not that I'm aware of. Were there any protesters around even trying to cause any damage to that location? Uh, no, most of the protesters that were still up at 59th with us were just standing around talking. After the, okay, so the police, we, I understand you may not have known it at the time, but it turned out that they established that line at 60th and, and pretty much kept it there. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. Did you ever, once that happened, did you ever walk through that line heading south on Sherry? Yes. Who was with you when you did that? Um, Jason Lukowski, Kyle Rittenhouse, and Dustin Colette was supposed to be with us. When you say he was supposed to be, what happened? Um, once we got across the line, I turned around and didn't see him. Where did you go? Um, from there, I got mixed up in the crowd. I ran across the ultimate, went inside there, and came back and started looking for the defendant. Was this the time where the uh, Daily Caller reporter, Richie McG uh, McGinnis, was following you? We had passed Mr. McGinnis before we crossed the police line south of 60th. Okay. So you're aware of this video of Richie McGinnis interviewing the defendant and then you and the defendant walking south on Sheridan through the police line with Mr. McGinnis with you. Is that Correct. right? Is that the time you're talking about? Yes. And you said there was someone else, uh, Mr. Lukowski, with you? Yes. Is he? Do you know, is he pictured in that video? You see him following in behind us, I do believe. Okay. 
Now, we watched that video earlier today. Yes. Um, there is a time in which you uh, encounter some folks with some fire extinguishers. Do you remember that? No, I don't remember that. Once you passed 60th, uh, and just so we're clear, you were walking on the west side of uh, Sheridan Road. Correct. South of 60th. Um, Richie McGinnis is there uh, recording, correct? Yes. Tell us what you did after that point. Um, once we got through 60th, we kind of paused on the north side of 60th. They were throwing rocks at the cops. And once they saw us there, they stopped throwing. They kind of shifted where they were throwing the rocks at the cops immediately right next to us to a little further down. We walked across, and once we entered the crowd, uh, the defendant started asking people if they needed any first aid. I was doing the same. And walking through past there at an indeterminate time, I lost track of the defendant. Had you discussed with the defendant what your plan was once you crossed that police line? We were going to check and see if anybody needed any first aid, then go down to 63rd and make sure nobody was destroying it. And... I'm not sure if the defendant was there when I said it, but me and Lakowski had agreed that if we got separated, we would go back to 59th. Did you have any specific instructions for the defendant uh, when you were heading out in that location? Um, yeah, it was just stay close, don't get separated, and see if anybody's hurt. You also told him to keep his mouth shut and not engage with people, correct? Um, I told several individuals at 59th Street that. Including the defendant? I believe I told him not to respond the way he was to certain people. What do you mean the way he was? Um, that goes back to earlier in the night when he said, I love you too, ma'am. That's when I told him, hey, don't say that. Don't even respond. Why not? Uh, just because it's... It can cause somebody to escalate the situation if they feel like you're making fun of them a little bit. So it just wasn't needed. So the plan once you cross 60th is stay together, but if you get separated, go back. Correct. And try not to engage. Correct. And you said there came a time in which you lost track of the defendant. This is correct. How did that happen? Um, got lost in the crowd. Um, I had a female protester approach me and started to try to get into an, a pro-gun, anti-gun exchange. Um, from there, I went inside to see if he had one of the ultimate to get any, ga any snacks. Uh, when I came back out, I encountered more individuals protecting the property. I talked to them. Uh, I assumed at the time he wasn't, that he wasn't over there anymore and I started to make my way back north to 59th. Can we please uh, play exhibit number 17? I'm gonna need to turn on the TVs again. So guys are kind of like medics who are packing. Yeah, right? basically. Well, he's an EMT. And I'm gotcha. Just, I'm just kind of protecting his ass. Oh, so you're a certified EMT? Yeah. Gotcha. And do you work as an EMT normally? Yes, sir. I got the thing that I, I'm a lifeguard normally. I got my ALS and I got my Gotcha. And I'm former Army Infantry and I got a whole bunch of trial training. So. <laughs> well, thank you for your service. We got you. I appreciate the service. <laughs> oh, shit. Anybody need medical? Anybody need medical? We're running. 
Pause the video right there. Did you see yourself in that video? Yes. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it appears that you uh, are a little bit ahead of Mr. Rittenhouse in this video, uh, but then you start walking east across Sheridan Road. Correct. Okay. And in that direction is the ultimate gas station. Yes. Do you remember where you went after that? That's the point at which I went inside the gas station okay. and then came back out. I thought I heard you say that the purpose of going across the police lines was to see if people are hurt and to go check on the 63rd Street location. That is correct. Help me understand, how does going to the ultimate gas station and going inside fit in with that? Because uh, there were other people at the ultimate gas station. I, I don't understand what that To means. go over there to see if they're hurt, too. Oh, I see. So you went over there to see if those people needed help? Yes. Did you go inside the ultimate gas station? Yes. And I think you said at one point you were going to get a snack for yourself. Yeah. Did you know at that point that you were leaving the defendant? No. What did you expect he was going to do at that point? I thought he was following me. How long was it before you realized he hadn't followed you? Uh, by the time I got across the street. What did you do then? Uh, I continued on to the ultimate gas station and talked to some of the guys there, turned around, he wasn't around, went back inside and went inside. Inside the gas station? Yes. Why didn't you go looking for the defendant? Um, I assumed that he had went inside the gas station as well. And then when you looked inside, did you see him? No. So where did you look for him then? Back outside the gas station. In the gas station lot? Yes. And this is a time in the evening when there are a lot of people in that lot? This is correct. Did you find him? No. So if he's not inside the gas station and he's not in the lot, did you go out uh, around the area looking for him? I walked on the outside of the crowd and tried to look for him, and then I decided to head north to 59th. Why is that? That's where I told Lukowski we should go. Do you know where Jason Lukowski was at this point in the video that we just paused at? Um, he was behind Richard McGinnis in this. And when you walked across Sheridan to the east, uh, do you know where Mr. Lukowski went? No idea. When is the next time you saw Mr. Lukowski? Um, after the shootings happened. So when you went back, when you left Ultimate Gas and headed back to 59th Street, did you see Mr. Lukowski at that point? No. Did he return to 59th Street while you were back there? I never made it back to 59th Street. Why is that? The uh, shooting started. Okay. And we'll get to that in a moment. Yep. So... <laughs> Your testimony is that as we're watching this video now, which has been taken by Richie McGinnis, and we see the defendant right there, that Jason Lakowski is somewhere uh, close by. He should be. Okay. Can we continue to play the video, please? Let us know if you see Mr. Lakowski, okay? It just fucking stung. Just, uh, I, I knew. Like, I, little pepper yeah, boy never hurt exactly. nobody. It was literally just like, oh, It's a little fuck. spicy, that's all. It was like, oh, shit. <laughs> that was really annoying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little salsa. Like, like, I could shoot my friend. Could you please not? <laughs> Does anybody need medical? Does anybody need medical? I think someone's got some medical weed, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Does anybody need medical? Sorry, I don't, I don't feel 
I'm going to stop it there because there's nothing to see in the rest of this video. Did you see Jason Lukowski at any point in this video? No, but the camera never panned to the rear either. Sure, I understand. I'm just asking if you saw him. Okay, fair enough. So you indicated that you went over to the ultimate gas and then eventually back to 59th. I headed towards 59th. Okay. When is the, the next time, after what we have just saw here, when is the next time you saw the defendant that night? I didn't see him again that night. At all? Outside of a picture, no. All right, I would like to play exhibit number 18 at that uh, timestamp I indicated, please. Things are a lot more peaceful now. The cops decided to gas the fucking area. Yeah. Here I am walking the EMT around, protecting his ass. Now the EMT's working out. <laughs> yeah. Seconds. I we missed a little bit of the beginning of this. A little bit further. Yeah. Let's play there, please. And we'll see how this. Uh, goes since everyone seems to be peaceful now with the militia. Seems like things are a lot more peaceful now. The cops decided to gas the fucking area. Yeah. Here I am walking the EMT around, protecting his ass. Now the EMT's working out. <laughs> Pause that for a second. Um, you saw yourself in that video. Yes. You mentioned that the police decided to gas something or something or other. I didn't quite catch it all. What, what, what were you talking about there? I was talking about when they gassed the 59th Street location. When you say they, you mean the police? Yes. When did that happen? Um, in the video where they show them throwing me and the defendant a bottle of water. It's like immediately preceding that. So why do you know what, what was going on that caused the police to... Um, they saw that we had protesters standing in and amongst us, and it seemed like they didn't care for that too much. Were you affected by that gas? Yes. How so? <clears throat> well, I'd already been hit, and hit with a some sort of gas bomb from the protest crowd, and then that's when the gas hit the area. So I had to go inside and sit down for a couple of minutes. And when you say gas, is this like a, a tear gas type thing? Tear gas, yeah. Okay. What physical effect did that have on you? Um, I couldn't breathe for a good minute and a half there solidly. Um, once I got in, sat down, the defendant helped me out with that. Um, I was okay. For the days after, I really couldn't talk too well. What did the defendant do to help you? Uh, kept shoveling water at me. So. Did he give you any sort of medicine or anything no. like that? Okay. So when you're talking about the police gassing things, that's what you're referring to? Yes. And then you talk about something about the EMT having to guard the EMT or something like that? Yes. What did you mean by that? I said that's, I was referring to me watching the defendant. So you're basically saying that it, one of your roles was to, to pr yeah, guard and protect the Yeah, that was part defendant. of my intent for going south. And it, this conversation occurs at the ultimate gas station? Yes. Where is this time-wise in relation to what we had just seen the last video where you were being uh, followed by Richie McGinnis, and then we saw you walk east across Ultima Gas. Where is this in relation to that? I don't remember exactly when I had this conversation, but I would say it was probably pretty soon after that. So this is after you walk across the street, you said you went into the store, yep. grabbed some snacks or whatever, and then I think you actually said earlier you spoke to some of the folks that were... 
I'm trying to uh, set the time frame for the jury, but the ultimate relevance, Your Honor, is that this, this witness is indicating that his role was to protect the defendant that night. And he's obviously not uh, with the defendant at this moment. What would be the relevance of that anyway? Well, I think it goes to the overall issue of the safety of the defendant and the, the safety of this crowd, the perceived need, the perceived danger, the perceived need for protection south of 60th perceived Street. Perceived by whom? By at least this individual who's close to the defendant. What relevance would his perception because they're part of the same group and he's taken this responsibility and now they're in an area where there's a perceived need to protect the defendant. Well, why don't we take a break? Um, uh, please don't talk about the case during the break. Uh, uh, read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Uh, we'll see you about uh, uh, five after. It's 3.46. Oh, pardon me? Well, you're right. It's, it, it, yeah, you're right. We're going. To, she's correct. As I've complained about that clock before, we're going to start at four o'clock on of actual time, and pay no attention to that clock, which you won't be able to see from the jury room anyway. Okay. Okay. Four o'clock actual time, Central Standard Time. Well, whatever, whatever. They know. They know what it. How precise I am about times anyway. What's that? Mark Smith and his patrolman just walking by him. The witness. He's not supposed to do that. I stole, oh I man! Stole this seems like it's been going on forever. Well, like I said, I think we broke it. It was like 22 when we broke. We started like. We had Mr. Yeah, McWilliams or McWilliams. Oh, McGinnis. We had Mr. McGinnis, and we took a break, and that's when. This has been on. This current witness, how long has he been on? How about two weeks? And I'm Back, maybe he's good you know he knows a lot more about his case than I do.
Bridge coming down. Hello. Would you come down, please? Yep. 